Dr. Wenda. Yes. Yeah, since now it's already 8 a.m., so uh, I guess okay. we try to keep uh, this activity on time. So okay. uh, shall we start uh, this lecture? Yeah, sure. We okay. can start now. We don't have to wait okay. for everyone else. Uh, okay. uh, did you prepare your CV on your slide or not? Oh. Uh, no, I, I did not prepare a CV. Oh, okay. I, I guess uh, uh, maybe I, I, I would like to uh, briefly introduce uh, you to all participants here. So could you please, uh, how to say stop share uh, firstly? Okay, sure. Yeah, I will try to open uh, the slide in all, my side. Yes, uh, so this part is a slideshow. Okay, okay, uh, all right, very uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, again, uh, welcome to our uh, visiting professor uh, lecture series. Yeah, uh, for uh, water and wastewater treatment, yeah, regarding to the innovation in water and wastewater treatment. So we are uh, very, how to say, honor to have uh, our friend, yeah, Dr. Owenda from uh, School of Chemical Science, University Science Malaysia. Uh, I met him last year, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, <laughs> but uh, almost uh, the end of last year. But yeah, very fortunate, uh, we have very, or to say uh, good connections yeah, for many purposes. And Dr. Weda, thank you so much for your uh, great and continued support yeah, on many matters uh, in uh, how to say many academic purposes as well as research in our department. So we are very thankful for, for your great support uh, on many program yeah, that uh, been organized by uh, chemistry department, Indonesia University of Education. So as I mentioned before, uh, this program uh, was supported by World Class uh, uh, University program of uh, Indonesia University of Education that also supported by uh, Ministry of Education and Culture. So uh, today uh, we would have uh, the, how to say, the first uh, uh, lecture from Dr. Winda uh, before he start starting his presentation. So here I would like to uh, uh, deliver the information, yeah. Uh, current position of Dr. Wenda now in School of Chemical Science, University of Science Malaysia is senior lecturer. Uh, even though still senior, but uh, you can see here, yeah, he is a great achievement. He has a very uh, amazing for age index, yeah, and also the number of citation regarding to his age, yeah, still very young, even though maybe younger, uh, more than younger than me, but the achievement is very inspiring for us. Uh, if you are interested in uh, into his uh, research work, research interest and research topic, please kindly refer his uh, personal website as well as his corpus profile, uh, also in the Google Scholar, yeah. It's very easy to find, just put uh, his name and then, yeah. Um, many papers yeah, will be appear with a very huge uh, citation, citation number. And here we try to summary uh, several of his uh, main interests, research interests. Uh, uh, basically, he, he is uh, focusing on uh, development of advanced functional materials for environmental catalysis. Also uh, uh, in the topic of water to resources yeah, regarding to the material and energy applications. Also, the other topic is about uh, novel uh, chemical technologies yeah, for water and most water treatment. And also some uh, innovations in bioremediation technique, absorption and regeneration of the spent absorbent. So it's a very, how to say, very appropriate, yeah, his expertise, his research interest with the uh, lecture that would be delivered yeah, uh, within this half semester. Uh, I do believe uh, through this, uh, how to say term, uh, he can share yeah, many uh, information and also knowledge, uh, also advance, uh, uh, how to say, uh, of his research work yeah, regarding to the water and wastewater treatment innovation. Uh, 
and uh, this is his uh, information about the educational record yeah he graduated uh, uh, for uh, undergraduate and master program uh, uh, in chemistry and environmental chemistry from school of chemical science university of malaysia and then continued to nanyang technology university for taking the phd program in material science and environmental engineering yeah this kind may be of uh, interdisciplinary graduate school yeah uh, in nanyang uh, technology university and uh, here is the following of his employment history so so far he's uh, now uh, affiliated to the uh, school of chemical science as the university lecturer uh, as as well he also has a great opportunity to be guest lecturers i guess not only in school of chemical environmental engineering nanyang technology university of singapore but nowadays maybe come to department of chemistry indonesia university of education yeah uh, also he's very active i guess uh, one of uh, the most rising uh, so far based on my knowledge uh, lecturer and also researcher in school of chemical science university science malaysia he he has uh, many how to say a research grant yeah that supported his research work also affiliated for some uh, fellowship yeah or research associate in uh, uh, several project not on, not only in in the national level but uh, also in the international level yeah. so far that i knew in singapore japan yeah in uh, china uh, but maybe later on yeah he can add more information uh, I guess uh, uh, here is the final slide, yeah, as our brief introductions of our invited professor for this lecture. So uh, actually more than this, yeah, so many <laughs> publications uh, in his, uh, how to say, uh, uh, Scopus profile, yeah, as well as the Google Scholar. Uh, but here we try to list it, uh, some topic that very close related to the content that will be delivered during uh, our lecture, yeah, that will be delivered by him. So for the one who wanted to learn more, to read more his uh, uh, research result, yeah, please kindly refer his uh, website as well as his uh, Scopus profile. So Dr. Wenla, uh, this is uh, our brief introductions for your lectures. I guess without any further ado, uh, uh, time and uh, how to say room is yours. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. So I'm very happy that uh, I'm very well uh, introduced by you. So today we are going to go through uh, a very general overview of um, water treatment and innovation. Okay, so the main thing that we want to go through today, in this particular class is to, um, to answer this question, why we need innovation in water treatment. Okay. So this is something that is very important. We need to have innovation so that we can do improvement to our water treatment. But of course, some of you might be wondering, our water is already there, right? We can go to the tap water, we can turn on the tap, and then the water is available. So why we still need to innovate something to give us uh, water? Right? So today we will answer this question. So before that, uh, just to... Introduce myself again. I'm uh, Owenda and from the School of Chemical Sciences. Huh? So if you want to know about my research or anything related to what I'm doing, you can go to my uh, Google site. I, I put this uh, link over here. You can always uh, visit that site and you can contact me uh, okay, through the email at that site. Okay? So I will be more than happy to answer any question that you have related to this topic. So uh, yeah, this is what we are going to go through over the course of eight weeks. So today we are going to talk about introduction. We are going, going to touch on the surface only today on uh, various issues. So all this will give you some basics. I, I'm not sure whether you know all these uh, basic things or not, but I'm just going to cover it anyway, so that when we talk about other topics, you'll understand better. Okay, so this will be what we are going to do today. And at the end of the lecture today, we are going to have a short quiz okay, for everyone here. And uh, this quiz will be very simple quiz. Okay, 
Okay, and it will be only about eight questions. I'm sure everything uh, that I talk about today, you will be able to answer. Okay, so you should be able to answer that uh, later. And uh, next week, I will talk about membrane science and technology. And this membrane science and technology in general is very important okay? uh, because uh, nowadays a lot of people are using membrane science and technology, especially RO membrane, to get water. Right. So if you look at the overall uh, Planet, our planet Earth, right? So where, where can we find the most water from? Definitely from the sea, right? Because sea, you have about 70% water. So a lot of people are trying to see whether we can use this membrane technology to recover water from the sea. So this is what we are going to talk about next week and uh, the week after that. And then we are going to cover innovation absorption technology, bioremediation technology, disinfection technology, and then finally, uh, we are going to end this eight week with the AOP, okay? Advanced Oxidation Processes. And um, just to let you know, in case you have any question, okay, you can stop me anytime. And if I go too fast, please let me know. Right? Uh, I will try to slow down. Right? Um, and if I go too slow, you can also let me know. I will speed up, okay? So, okay, so this is what we want to Talk about today water pollution and what is it so i'm sure most of you know what exactly is water pollution but we are going to look at what is the exact definition of it and then uh, we are going to talk about wastewater management just a brief uh, introduction of this how we manage water in uh, different areas and then uh, some regulation okay so environmental regulation related to water and then uh, we want to talk about water quality standards uh, and then water quality index and some water quality parameters that you should know because uh, all these uh, water parameters that we talked about today are very important when you want to look at whether the water is drinkable or not. Okay? And finally, we are going to go to the question that we want to answer. Why we need to innovate new technology. Okay? So, so what exactly is this water pollution? In general, this is very subjective. You know? So water pollution happens when you cannot use this water for your intended use. For example, if you talk about semiconductor industry, right? So if you look at semiconductor industry, they need very high grade water. That means very pure water. So if you want to use that water to be used for the semiconductor industry, so in general, you cannot do that because the tap water is too polluted for the semiconductor industry. So then if you want to use the tap water for like showering, bathing or drinking, you can do that. Okay. Uh, that means that the water is not polluted for that particular application. So if you see the water pollution definition is very subjective. Okay. It depends on the user itself. You want to use it for what application and if you cannot use it, it is polluted. Okay. So in terms of uh, pollution, right, it can come from various sources. For example, you have the non-point sources uh, whereby you cannot detect where it comes from. Okay? Which means that, for example, in agricultural area whereby you have a lot of uh, crops, people using fertilizer, right? So when you have rain, then this rain will carry a lot of pollutant into the river. So you don't know where it comes from. Let me just get a pen. Yeah, yeah. So from the slides over here, you can see this is a cropland, right? So uh, if you have uh, like pollution, like raining or anything, the pesticides will go into the river. Okay. So you don't know where it comes from, and this is why we call it as non-point sources. Whereas another type of uh, water pollution uh, sources is a point sources, whereby this one, we know where it comes from. Okay. This is the definition of point sources. Uh, for example, wastewater treatment plant, right. you know that this wastewater treatment plant, you have an outlet here that is releasing all those treated water. If this particular outlet gives you polluted water, and then you know that you need to find a solution to make sure that whatever is released by the wastewater treatment plant is treated properly. So non-point sources and point sources, um, they are the main water pollution sources. And then of course, if you look at these two, the point sources is easily treated. Okay. For example, if you look at wastewater treatment plant, if you know that the 
pollution comes from this wastewater treatment plant, you can easily upgrade the wastewater treatment plant and then this will solve the problem. Whereas for non-point sources, the first thing that you have to do to solve this issue is to locate where the pollution is. So to do that is not so easy, it's very difficult because you need to uh, do a lot of uh, study and then you have to find from different parts and so on. So it is not like a, it's a very small area. If you look at the non-point sources, it can cover a very huge area. It's like a, sometimes it's like a Penang Island. I don't know whether you know the size of Penang Island or not. It's uh, pretty huge, right? So uh, this Penang Island itself is usually like an agricultural area. You want to find where, where the sources of pollution comes from, you need to search everywhere. So, so it's not so easy. Uh. Okay. So just to give you some overview of how water is generally treated and the difference between water treatment plant and wastewater treatment plant. I mean, there, there's a difference. Okay. The water treatment plant, if you look at this uh, figure over here that I prepared. So if you have water treatment plant, that means you are uh, up, uh, taking up this water. Okay. You are taking up this water from river into the water treatment plant. And then you are channeling it to the consumer, which means that we take this water, we draw it from a source. It can be river, it can be lake or anywhere. It goes to the consumer. And then this consumer will take this water and then it will consume it as their own. Maybe they use it for showering, maybe they use it to wash something and so on. After consumption, this water will go to the waste water treatment plant. Okay? And uh, this waste water treatment plant will treat all the water that you use, and then it will go back to the river again. Okay. And then this is like a cycle, water cycle. This is a very general water cycle. Right. So if you look at this cycle, you can see that there's a problem in terms of uh, this part, the consumption part. Right. So whatever we release into the water, it will eventually go into the wastewater treatment plant. And if the things that we release in the water is not treated by wastewater treatment plant, what happens is that it will go to the river and it will cause a lot of problem. So generally, if you look at water treatment plant, you don't know that uh, it typically, typically undergoes a process of regulation, flocculation, sedimentation, and so on, right? So this one, you, I, I believe you have covered this before. Right? So after that, you go to the uh, consumption and you go to waste water treatment plant. Usually this waste water treatment plant, we use biological method. So the most common one, people use biological treatment because it is cheap. So biological treatment is using microorganism. You use microorganism, you degrade all the pollutants, and then after that, you release it into the river. So if you don't treat the pollutant uh, effectively, for example, sometimes you when you consume this uh, antibiotics, right, and then this antibiotics, it goes into the uh, sink, right? You throw it into the sink and then it goes to the wastewater treatment plant. By right, this wastewater treatment plant that we have today, they are not designed to remove all these antibiotics. So in the end, you end up in the river and then it goes to the water treatment plant. And again, water treatment plant is not designed to treat the antibiotics. It can eventually reach back to us. So it's like a, it's like a circle. Okay? So whatever we release, we have to be very sure that we release something that is not hazardous to the environment. Okay, so this is how a water uh, cycle is typically is. Uh. Okay, so I want to talk a bit on uh, factors that contribute to the increase in water pollution. Okay, there are many different uh, factors that can cause water to be polluted. For example, urbanization. This one, uh, when we have a lot of people, right? When population is growing. So this, will create something that uh, is um, giving high demand of water needs, right? So that means that people will need to uh, use more water and then they will excrete a lot of waste. So when you have an excretion of waste into the environment in the very large amount, then definitely you will exceed the capacity of our wastewater treatment plant. And then eventually pollution will happen. So this has been proven uh, a lot of times, okay. When population increase, you have uh, you have problem in terms of the pollution issue. 
Then other things like deforestation. Uh, deforestation, when you chop down trees, uh, for example, you want to, you want to uh, do some agriculture, right? So in Malaysia, we have a lot of palm oils, right? And I, I believe in Indonesia, we also have a lot of palm oils, right? So these palm oils, uh, you want to cultivate this palm oil tree. So you have to find a land. And then this land, of course, uh, usually we get it from the forest. And when we do this kind of uh, activity, we will lead to pollution in terms of the increase in soil erosion. Okay, soil erosion means that the soil being transported from one place to another place. Uh, when this soil contains a lot of uh, heavy metals or maybe, maybe nutrients like uh, nitrogen compounds, when you have this transportation from one place to another place, especially to the river area, then you will have pollution, okay? water pollution. So uh, other things like destruction of wetland, uh, construction of them, all this will lead to problematic uh, water pollution. So other things uh, that can contribute to water pollution includes expansion of uh, industrial mining activities. Uh, for example, if you have heavy, met uh, heavy metals, uh, you want to mine uh, maybe bauxite or something like that, and then you mine it in that area and you will in indirectly cause the increase in heavy metals pollution because all these uh, things that you mine, sometimes it doesn't only come with the things that you want. It also comes with a lot of heavy metals, right? So this will cause uh, heavy metal pollution. So agricultural activity, as you know, you use a lot of fertilizer, pesticides, and uh, eventually all this will come to the river. We will look into it in the further detail later. So utilization of primary fuel. Uh, this one, uh, if you use uh, a fuel that contains heavy metals like lead, then you will cause environmental damage. Okay? And uh, this one, uh, accidental water pollution will also cause problem. This one, you, you can see that there are a lot of issues with the uh, water pollution uh, due to oil spillage, uh, especially in the Alaska. I don't know whether you know Alaska, uh, Alaska we have this issue whereby uh, there's a large uh, oil spillage okay? and it caused a lot of uh, damage to the ecosystem nearby. Okay, so next, I uh, just want to give you some overview of uh, the condition that will affect a chemical pollutant uh, from being identified as whether it is a pollutant or it is not a pollutant. So we have to look at several things before we can say that these particular chemicals, they are very harmful to the environment. For example, you need to look at the characteristics of the chemical itself. Okay? And you want to look at the aquatic reaction and then uh, biological species uh, requirement, okay? uh, temperature uh, of that particular environment, uh, concentration and dilution effect. So when I talk about characteristics of pollutant, that means whether the pollutant is likely to be degraded in the environment or not. So if you have a chemical that um, have a very short half-life, which means that you throw it into the river, and then when in, in this chemical, uh, it has a very short half-life, right? so it will degrade very fast in the environment. That means this chemical is no longer a pollutant when you release it. So we don't have to be concerned about that. So other things like aquatic uh, reaction, whether let's say you have heavy metals, right? Heavy metals, when you release it into the uh, environment, sometimes these heavy, heavy metals can dissipate in the environment. Sometimes it can react with something. So we have to know what is the uh, active heavy metal that's in the water before we can classify that as your pollutant. Okay. Other things like biological uh, requirement, uh, temperature, all these are yeah, also important, which we will look at a bit further later. Okay, so these are the main factors when we want to evaluate the pollutants. First is the toxicity, whether it has long-term toxicity effect or short-term effect. So let me give you an example. If you look at mercury, okay, mercury itself uh, is a very toxic uh, heavy metal. Right? So if you look at uh, many, many years ago in uh, Japan, right? Japan, they have this mercury issue. Uh, many, many years ago in 1940s or 1930s, uh, this, uh, there's an uh, industry that's growing whereby they release a lot of mercury to the river and the sea. 
Okay. So when they do these kind of things, uh, this mercury, they don't know that it will accumulate in fishes. Right? So when you have accumulation of mercury in fishes and it's started by human, then we will tend to suffer from the effect of the mercury. So Japan, they have this issue with the uh, mercury. Um, and they, have, they call this as a Minamata disease, if not mistaken. Right, then there's this issue with the Minamata disease whereby a lot of their people are suffering from uh, nervous, uh, nervous uh, effect. Okay? Uh, they are, they are nerve got some uh, problem because they are uh, taking too much mercury. So when this happens, then uh, it causes a lot of harm to the population and eventually their economy starts to suffer. So they start to find what is the problem and they found out that it's the mercury that caused this thing to happen. So toxicity is very important in terms of long-term toxicity and short-term toxicity. Short-term toxicity means that it can uh, show up very fast. Okay. So the mercury, that example that I gave you just now, uh, it caused a long-term toxicity. This is more dangerous lah, compared to the short-term one. Long-term toxicity builds up over time. Lah. Okay. It means that uh, once you have this uh, mercury in the ocean or river, uh, after 10 years only, you realize that this particular uh, chemical that you dump into the ocean starts to give you effect. Short terms means that, for example, if you dump a phenol into the ocean, then uh, the effect is very immediate because this phenol can, um, can cause very short term acute toxicity to a lot of fishes. You'll see that fish starts to die and so on. Okay. So other factors that uh, contribute to this uh, toxicity includes uh, persistent, uh, persistence and non-degradable, uh, which means that if you have these chemicals uh, in the water, okay, and whether it stays at it for its form or maybe it's degraded into something else. Okay. So this is important when you want to look at the water treatment and wastewater treatment, because if a chemical that is pers persistent to biodegradation, and you want to treat it using biological system, it will be quite difficult to do so. Okay. So sometimes uh, we need to know the characteristics of that particular pollutant before we can uh, find a solution to that problem. Okay. So degradable, uh, another factor, degradable, as for example, organic substances, whether it's degradable or not. Uh, radioactive materials, uh, sometimes radioactive materials can disintegrate. So these are the factors that also we also look at when you want to see whether it's a pollution or not. Uh, biological accumulation, okay, this one, uh, okay, you have a degradable and non-degradable that sometimes can be accumulated in the body. So the mercury case I gave you just now comes from mostly consuming fishes. Okay? So the fish, for example, salmon that you purchase from uh, Japan, you have to be very careful uh, when you want to eat that. Uh, because we don't know whether it has mercury or not, especially the one that you bought from Japan because they have this problem previously. So very, very important when you want to buy fishes uh, that's imported from Japan, you have to look at the packaging to see whether they say that whether it's mercury free or not. If it's not mercury free, then uh, you, you have to be very careful uh, whether you want to consume it or not. So other things like distribution. Okay? Distribution means that um, whether it can be distributed or not, whether it's at a local area when it's uh, exposed to the environment or not. Okay? And then we have the chemical uh, transformation. Okay? Sometimes when you have a pollutant, you can be transformed into several other species. Sometimes it can undergo reaction, redox reaction or biological reaction and so on. So uh, all this will determine how easy you can to control the pollutants. Okay? So I give you an example that we have in Malaysia. Uh, this one uh, has caused a lot of this uh, short-term harm to the population. So this is very recent. <clears throat> this is in uh, 2019, whereby we have this chemical dump uh, at a, a river called uh, Sungai Kim Kim. Okay. So this, there's these um, people, okay? irresponsible people, they dump chemicals, uh, organic chemicals into the river. Okay, and then when they dump it, then they just uh, ignore the toxicity effect because they thought that when they dump all these things into the river, people will not suffer from the toxicity effect because of the dilution from the river itself. 
but they are wrong because they dump uh, too many of these things okay, in the higher concentration. And then when this uh, chemical gets into the river, it starts to uh, volatilize. Okay? Some, some of these organic compounds starts to volatilize, which means that uh, it becomes vapor. So when it becomes vapor, for example, benzene, it can reach up to three-story high. And it affected quite a number of people. For example, uh, you can see in this uh, slides, March 7, we have 103 victims. And then March 12, we have 260 at this uh, area. So uh, this is one of the implication of uh, dumping waste irresponsibly, irresponsibly into the river. So one of the problem that we have is uh, people tend to do this kind of uh, things uh, because okay, the, the main reason why people want to dump all these chemicals into the river is because of the cost of treating the hazardous waste. So treatment of hazardous waste is very, very expensive. So it, it's not so, uh, it, it's not like you can just take it and then you can just throw it into the wastewater treatment plant and then everything will be, uh, will be settled. Because this, uh, this involves very volatile and very carcinogenic compound. For example, you see here, we have benzene, which is, has been proven carcinogenic. So to, to treat this, uh, it costs a lot of money and then you cannot use the normal conventional way of treatment. So just want to uh, go through with you uh, okay, how we can evaluate the impact of chemical pollutants. Okay? So sometimes when you throw a pollutant, different pollutants, they have different, uh, different toxicity level and whether they are in the environment, we can evaluate them based on several criteria. So all these are the questions that we ask when we want to know whether this chemical will have a very severe impact or not. So one thing is that how long will this chemical persist in the environment? So which means that how fast they can be degraded. For example, you can have hydrolysis, photolysis, biodegradation as a form of uh, removing the pollutant by nature. Right? So in the nature, if you throw this uh, pollutant uh, into the river, sometimes biodegradation can happen because we have microorganism in the river. It can uh, pick up these uh, chemicals that you throw in as their food. So sometimes they cannot do that. So the things, the chemicals that cannot be hydrolyzed or biodegraded easily, that's the thing that we have to worry about. Okay? So the second question that we want to look at is how does a chemical move from one compartment to another? This is uh, concerning the mobility of the pollutant itself. Sometimes this chemical can be volatilized, like just now the example that I give you uh, concerning this volatile uh, pollution in Malaysia. Uh, you have volatilization, okay, whereby the chemicals can uh, become uh, airborne and then it can go to the uh, nearby people, okay, and it will cause a lot of harmful effect. So I give you an example of uh, in terms of this. Uh, mobility of the pollutant. Okay. Let's look at these uh, pesticides in China. Okay. So you look at this uh, consumption of pesticide, you can have up to 52.4 million kilograms of pesticide being used. Okay. And uh, pesticide loss here, you can see 15% of the pesticide use is lost to the environment. So the question is, where does this pesticide go? Okay. So it can end up in our river water. It can uh, end up in the, maybe in the fruit, maybe uptake by the plant or something. Right? We don't know that. But it's very, very dangerous because sometimes the pesticide that you use may cause severe impact with the environment. So you look at the pesticides, we are introducing uh, pesticides almost every year. Okay, The new pesticide, we just uh, tie it into the agriculture area. So this is a problem because the toxicity effect of pesticides needs many, many years to come. For example, DDT. I, I'm sure a lot of uh, us heard about DDT. The DDT is a chemical that people use uh, as a pesticide many years ago. I think someone won a Nobel Prize because of this uh, DDT. Okay? And uh, DDT, uh, initially we thought there's no problem with DDT. We keep using it. Okay, in a very large amount. Eventually, 
it starts to uh, give problem because it affects birds. Birds, when they are exposed to DDT, their eggs cannot hatch because of certain problem. Okay, and uh, because of this, uh, the red starts to grow, right? And then our environment ecosystem starts to suffer. Okay? So you can see that we have so many losses of pesticide, as I said, 15%. And uh, this is something that is of concern. And how this pesticide can, um, can go about, it can go about through many um, processes. For example, volatilization. That means pesticide that you put into the agricultural area, it becomes uh, something in the air. Okay, so this something uh, in the air, it can be transported to somewhere else. Okay? And uh, other things is like sorption to soil. Okay? That means it's through adsorption process. So when you have uh, pesticides that can be uh, adsorbed on the soil, then this is a problem because the soil usually sometimes it can have erosion. So you can go from one place to another place and then the soil will carry the pesticide along with it. So other uh, fate is through photo degradation. You have microbial uh, degradation and you have leaching towards groundwater. All these are the processes that will contribute to the uh, mobility of the pesticides. So other things uh, include, uh, okay, how does a food chain contamination can occur when, when you have uh, chemicals in the environment and it does not affect the food chain? Then it's less of our concern because it will not reach us, right? So, but if it affects the food chain, that means there's a very high potential that this chemical can come to us. So mercury itself is uh, bioaccumulable bioaccumulable, which means that you can uh, have this uh, mercury being accumulated in the, in the organism. So we know that this can happen. Mercury is a toxic uh, chemical. Okay? It's a hazardous pollutant. So like fishes, like at the example I give you just now, fishes consume mercury, and then eventually the mercury comes to us. Okay? So uh, other physical characteristics that we have to be aware of are like uh, solidity of uh, the pollutant, uh, this octano water partition, uh, hydrolysis, photolysis, all these uh, they are, they are the characteristics of water that you have to know, okay? to know whether it is behaving uh, correctly. Okay? It will not cause any pollution or not. So we, this one we will look at in the table later. Okay, this one, okay, this one is uh, in terms of bioaccumulation. Okay, um, just to show you, highlight a bit more. If we have fish eating one ppm of uh, mercury, and then this large fish eat three of these small fish, then this large fish will have three ppm of mercury. So this uh, bird eat three of these large fish, and eventually this large fish will, uh, this, this bird will have three large fish worth of mercury in their, its body. Okay. So this is what we call as bioaccumulation effect. Okay. okay, so the characteristics of water uh, pollutant is very important uh, as follow uh, in the table. You can see if you have water solubility, this one I will share the slides, you can go through it later. Uh, okay. Water solubility, if you have very high water solubility, that means that it is very mobile. It is uh, biodegradable and can be metabolized very easily. So you can see here that the characteristics of the chemical itself will determine whether the pollutant is something that we have to address or not. So you will have hydrolysis life, very long hydrolysis life, which means that it tends to stay in the environment very long, likely to be persistent, and it is very difficult to degrade. Okay? So same thing for photolysis uh, and so on. So all these characteristics of chemicals they are very, very important. Okay. So sorption, uh, soil sorption also important. See whether it can be absorbed very easily or not, or it is mobile or not. Okay. okay all these are uh, just to give you some overview of uh, pollution, uh, water pollution issue, and the characteristics of chemicals that can cause water pollution. 
So that one, I believe you probably has already covered it uh, in this course in terms of how the chemical behave in the environment and so on. So I'm just giving you an overview. The second part I want to talk about, um, which is more important now, uh, is the wastewater management. The wastewater management, if you look at uh, our environment, our city, okay, how our wastewater is managed. So in, in general, we have a lot of uh, different waste, okay, wastewater, consisting of domestic waste, industrial waste, infiltration waste, and inflow. So these are all the main, main uh, water that is more polluted. And then the other type of water that we consider as wastewater okay, is the storm, storm water, which means water from rain. Okay? Sometimes when you have rain, you have a lot of water coming in, right? So this is what we call as storm water. Okay? And then uh, domestic uh, wastewater, we call it as uh, wastewater coming from the residential, commercial, institutional, and other facilities. Okay? Uh, the one that we consume every day. Okay. That means we, we go to the, uh, the toilet, we go to take a shower, all this water we consider as domestic uh, wastewater. And then we have the industrial wastewater, which means that it is uh, from the industry. Okay. Uh, the industrial wastewater that is channeled to the uh, wastewater treatment plant, usually it is not the toxic one. Okay. So the toxic one, uh, usually they will have a, uh, their own wastewater treatment plant. Okay, they have to treat the, the toxic part before they can channel it to the uh, municipal wastewater treatment plant. Okay. So industrial wastewater sometimes uh, can be cleaner than domestic wastewater, okay, depending on the nature of the uh, industry itself. Then in filtration, you have uh, leaks, cracks, okay, and uh, breaks, uh, breaks or porous wall. Okay. All this water can be infiltrated uh, and it is also considered as uh, wastewater. And inflow through storm drains and so on, all this, we also classify it as a wastewater. Okay. So all this will be channeled to the wastewater treatment plant. And of course, we have uh, two types of collection system in the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, one is the combined system, the other one is a separated system. Okay. So for the separated system, it means that you separate the sanitary collection system. Okay. All these four, we consider it as the sanitary collection, uh, sorry, sanitary wastewater. Okay. So all these, they are the wastewater that is slightly more polluted compared to the storm water. The separate one separates the storm collection system and the sanitary collection system. Okay. So the storm water, because it is relatively clean, so it can be directly discharged into the nearby water bodies. Okay? There's, there's no, no issue with that because it will not pollute the environment. But the other things like uh, domestic, industrial infiltration inflow, they will go to the wastewater treatment plant for treatment first before it is discharged into the nearby water body. The other one is the combined collection system, whereby you combine the stormwater inflow, infiltration, industrial, and domestic wastewater together, and you channel it to the wastewater treatment plant. Everything goes to the wastewater treatment plant. And then after treatment, you release it into the environment. So if you look at the separated and the combined system, uh, which one do you think is the better one? Okay. Because uh, if I look at it, the separated one would be better. Okay, compared to the combined system. So the reason is very simple. Okay? If you look at the combined collection system, okay, you combine everything together and then you send it to the wastewater treatment plant, uh, such as the one showing I show in the diagram over here. Right? So when you have excessive rain, like just now Dr. Fitri said that in Indonesia now we have you have a raining season, right? So if you have a lot of rain, right, you will tend to cause an overflow, right? If you combine everything together, then sometimes this uh, pollution from the uh, sanitary sewer tends to overflow into the river without treatment. So when this happens, the river will be very polluted. Okay? And uh, sometimes you can also overburden the wastewater treatment plant. Right? So when you have overburdened, then the wastewater treatment plant will not work as effectively as what you want. 
So this is a disadvantage of having this uh, combined collection system. Whereas if you have separated collection system, which means that you separate between uh, storm sewer and sanitary sewer, then it's relatively better because you will not overburden the wastewater treatment. Okay? You can see here, only the one that require treatment goes to the wastewater treatment plant. Whereas storm water, which is relatively clean, you can just discard it into the uh, river. Okay? The other uh, management of uh, wastewater is what we call as a centralized system and decentralized system. So these two generally, uh, they have their own advantages and disadvantages. Okay? So in uh, Singapore, people use centralized system. Okay? Whereas in, uh, if not mistaken, in many parts in Europe, they prefer to use decentralized system. Okay? And it depends on uh, case by case. Uh, okay? So the advantages of using centralized system is that you can collect the uh, water from various areas and you can channel it to it's a very large wastewater treatment plant, and then you can make reuse more efficient, efficiently, which means you can recycle the water better. Okay, so you can see here centralized system, everything will pump. Okay, the yeah, wastewater to a main uh, centralized unit, okay, wastewater plant, treatment plant. Okay, but of course, the industry sometimes don't really like to do this kind of. Uh, uh, system okay, or the centralized system because industry they have to pay when they want to discard their waste. So they have to pay the wastewater treatment uh, fund some money okay, so that the wastewater treatment plant can help them to treat their waste. Yeah. That's why sometimes uh, the industry prefer to have this decentralized system. Okay. So the centralized system um, it is uh, requiring the industry to have their own water treatment unit. Okay. Um, the, you can see go cost, over, go cost over here, it has its own wastewater treatment unit, city own wastewater treatment unit. Okay. So one of the advantage of this centralized system is that when you have this kind of system, it's easier for you to recover your resource. Okay. Waste itself is a resource. The wastewater sometimes contains a lot of carbon. The carbon, for example, COD, BOD, right? You have all these, uh, carbon that can be transformed into energy, right? So if the industry can utilize this waste, their own waste, to become energy to power up their uh, industry, okay? Or to power up their office. So, so this will be more beneficial for the industry to do so. Instead of paying the wastewater treatment plant to uh, handle the waste, the industry can change this waste into a resource for them to use. Okay? So this is one of the advantage of decentralized system. But the disadvantage of decentralized system is it requires space. Okay? You need a space uh, for that particular uh, treatment plant to be set up. Okay? And of course, if you look at uh, in, in Singapore, people prefer the cent uh, centralized system because they want to recycle water. Europe, decentralized system because they have a lot of land. So because of they have a lot of land, they want to build their own wastewater treatment plant so that they can recover their own resources. Okay. So generally, that's uh, about all the wastewater treatment management. That, that's just some basic for you to uh, know. Okay. So we will talk a bit more on centralized and decentralized and see how all these treatment uh, methods can fit into uh, a treatment technology that we are going to discuss in coming weeks. Uh, example, membrane treatment. How this membrane treatment can fit into the uh, centralized system or decentralized system. We will look into it for the details next week. Okay? So environmental regulation uh, are the is the next topic that I want to touch on. Everyone should know because uh, we have a lot of uh, standards okay, that, that we have to comply. So generally, we have uh, two types of standards. One is the stream standards. The other one is the effluent standard. Yeah. So these stream standards means that whatever you want to discharge into the environment or into the river, 
that particular river has to meet uh, the particular standard. That means the industry, whatever they discharge, they cannot cause the river to change in terms of parameter to become worse. Okay. And this stream standard okay, uh, is designed so that it is based on the intended use of that uh, water downstream. Okay. So let's say you look at this uh, figure over here. This is a figure in uh, a river in Singapore. So here, let's say you have an, a factory right here. Okay. You discharge something into the uh, river, right? Whatever you discharge here, you have to make sure that the stream still maintain at that particular uh, standard level, okay? that particular water quality. And the discharger themselves, they are the one that's responsible to make sure that this kind of uh, standard is met. Okay? And uh, in terms of the intended use of water, we have four common classes. Uh, okay? This is a very general classes. We have A, B, C, and D. Okay? And A means uh, water that's suitable for primary contact recreation, B uh, for maintenance and propagation, and then uh, for public water supply, and finally B for agriculture and industrial use. So all these different classes of uh, surface water, they need different uh, criteria. Okay? They have different standards. Okay? And uh, some standards, they could be stricter than the other. For example, if you want to look at the maintenance of fish, you need at least 5 ppm of PO. So which means the industry, when they want to release their wastewater to the river, they have to make sure that the river still have 5 ppm of DO. Okay. And uh, for class D, okay, class D, you only need 3 ppm. So the industry, whatever they release, they have to make sure that the DO of that particular water, uh, the river water, is maintained at 3 ppm. So one of the disadvantage of stream standard is that when you have a lot of industry, right, a lot of different uh, industry releasing wastewater into the river, um, it's very difficult to track. Okay? If pollution really happens, you don't know which of these uh, industry are the ones that uh, release the things that cause the wastewater to be, uh, the water to be very polluted. So it's very difficult to identify the polluter okay, through stream standards. Okay, just an example I want to show you in terms of stream standards. Uh, this is the European Union's bathing water. So this one, uh, they regulate several parameters, uh, including pathogens, uh, plankton and algae, uh, oil and pH. Okay. So all these, uh, they regulate it as a, as, a, as a means to maintain the standard of the stream. Okay. So in Europe, they very, uh, they are very keen on bathing in lakes and rivers. That's why they, they set up these stream standards to make sure that uh, whatever you want to discharge into the river it cannot cause pollution in terms of uh, this, all these parameters. Uh, okay? You cannot have pathogens in the river, uh, plankton, oil, and pH have to be maintained. Okay? So all these, they are uh, covered under stream standards. The other one is the affluent standards. Uh, so effluent standards in, is a standard whereby uh, you specify the amount of pollutant okay, that a, a polluter may discharge. You set the standards for them. So that means that whatever they want to discharge into the river, they, you have to make sure that they follow the standards. Okay? You cannot exceed a certain level. Right? And then usually it is uh, based on pollutant loading. Uh, okay? That means kilogram per day. Um, very rarely, they are based on uh, mass per unit volume, uh, milligram per liter. Okay? So most of the time, when you want to specify something okay, uh, to the industry people, you specify based on pollutant loading in terms of a mass per unit time. The reason is very simple, because if you use concentration unit, right? so let's say I have, a, I have something that I want to discharge into the river, and the concentration that I have exceeds exceeds the level that is allowed. So the only thing that I have to do is I, I can dilute the wastewater uh, so that the concentration achieve, achieve the 
uh, target, okay? And then I release it. So this is uh, not so good because sometimes when you do these kind of things, you are actually releasing more harmful substances into the river. That's why people prefer to use pollutant loading when they want to set a criteria. Okay, so one example of affluent standard okay, is this one, the European Union Water Framework Directive, whereby uh, they, the European Union, said that all the industry must remove all emission uh, to water bodies, okay? and they have to label properly what they want to release. They have to inform the government uh, what is the chemical that they are releasing, and so on. So sometimes uh, this kind of directive is problematic to the industry. So what they can do is they need to come up with a possible economical way to ensure that they will not suffer from the directive that is given by the government. So they, they usually will uh, probably treat the pollutant before they release it. And if they cannot do that, if it's not economical, they will change the raw materials of product formulation. Another one is the uh, affluent standard. So affluent standard is introduced a very long time ago, whereby uh, this uh, EPA, EPA is uh, one of the authority that can be uh, used, that, that is using their power to set water quality standards for industry and contaminant. So it is not legal to release the pollutant. Okay? Uh, that's what the EPA said. Okay? It's not legal to release any pollutant without any permit. Okay? And uh, yeah, the amount of type of pollutant they have to, uh, <clears throat> they have to be uh, informed. Okay? Everyone has to be informed of what are the types of pollutant and the amount of pollutant that they want to release. So, I cover stream standards and effluent standards. And the next question that probably some of you may want to know is that whether uh, stream standard or effluent standard are more effective in curbing pollution. So in generally, both are effective and both are applied at the same time, most of the time. Okay, so stream standard and effluent standard, they can uh, be applied together, which means that for a particular stream, you may have stream standard. And in the industry, when they want to discharge their effluent, they also have their own effluent standards. Both are applied together. Okay, so this is uh, important to ensure that whatever is released to the environment, they are well regulated. Okay, so next one. Uh, Okay, so I, I will maybe take a five minutes break uh, to answer some questions. Okay, so if you have any question, please post at the chat so that I can answer it. Okay, so I will take five minutes to answer questions before we proceed with the uh, part four to seven. Okay, is that okay with everyone? Sure, sure, doctor. Okay, so I have a question on uh, what should we consider to choose between centralized or the central decentralized system in managing wastewater. So, okay, for this uh, choosing, uh, it depends on a lot of factors. Okay? Most of the factor is all about money. Uh, uh, it's all about economy, economy, economic reason. Okay? So if you look at the uh, industry, when they want to, let's say they want to do some uh, treatment to their wastewater, and they know that their wastewater contains a lot of uh, carbon, carbon materials that can be used to generate energy. Right? Of course, they will want to recover that energy and use it for themselves. Right? Instead of taking this waste and then they uh, channel it to wastewater treatment plant and they pay other people to uh, recover the energy. And then after that, the other people, the wastewater treatment plant, uh, give back the energy to the uh, industry at the price, right? This is not so economical. So the more economical way is to have their own uh, decentralized wastewater treatment plant. So what I'm trying to say here is that for us to consider whether you want to use centralized or decentralized system, the economy aspect is the most important thing. So whether it is uh, beneficial or not beneficial for that particular industry. The second thing is in terms of 
the policy, the government policy. So if you look at Singapore, why they want to use a centralized system? The main reason is because they don't have water. They don't have sufficient water. Uh, and that's why they want to recycle water. So the best way to recycle water is to collect all the wastewater together and then recycle it. So um, Singapore is quite unique in the sense that they have this technology called the uh, uh, new water. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether you heard of uh, new water or not. But new water is a, an innovation uh, using membrane technology, okay, whereby uh, the wastewater that, that the, the, the Singapore citizen and industry generate goes to the wastewater treatment plant. And then after going through the treatment, the secondary effluent is uh, channeled to a membrane treatment so that they can get back the water and reuse it. So because of the lack of water in Singapore, the government come up with a policy to say that uh, all the water has to go to the centralized system uh, so that it can be reused for their own population. So this is uh, yeah, two reasons. Uh. One is the economic reason, the other one is the policy by the government. So any other questions that uh, anyone want to ask? In that case, I will proceed with the next uh, topic. Okay. So the next topic is in terms of the water quality standard. Okay. So this uh, water quality standard is something like a, the one that we talked about just now, the regulation. Uh, okay. So So oh, water quality, um, you have two different things. Uh. One is the water quality criteria. The other one is the water quality standards. So water quality, quality criteria usually is developed when you have a suggestion or indication that uh, something may be toxic to the environment. Okay. So this water quality criteria is, uh, is like a guide for us. Okay. And there's no enforcement. Okay. It's not a law. There's no power of enforcement. So it's just a suggestion. And it's not so useful because um, usually it's just a recommendation that you, let's say you have a pollutant. It's a recommendation that this pollutant, when you want to discharge it, it has to be below a certain level. So if this uh, industry finds that to have this pollutant reduced to a particular level, it's very cost costly. It's very expensive. So what happens is that the industry can choose to ignore this uh, water quality criteria, that there will be no uh, action taken to them. That's why it's not so useful, but it serves as a guide. So this guide usually is used to develop something called the water quality standards. Okay? And this water quality standards, there is a power of enforcement. Okay? This is uh, like by law. Okay? So it has to, the water quality standard has to be based on water quality criteria and it has to be reasonable in the sense that we, we must be able to implement it uh, at an economical uh, way. Okay? And that means it has to be cheap. You cannot set like all the water that you want to discharge must be of uh, deionized water quality. Okay? That's the best way, right? Everyone wants the water uh, discharge to be as clean as possible. But the problem is it's not economical to implement uh, this uh, water quality standards. Okay? It's too expensive. And uh, water quality standards is uh, politically influenced. Okay? Uh, which means that anything that uh, anything that is politically, politically influenced is very subjective. Huh? But of course, uh, it, it is provided in the form of a uh, processes or treatment, okay? which means that uh, it can come in the sense that if you want to discharge the water, you have to undergo this treatment. Okay? So this is one of the way we can, uh, we can set the water quality standards. The other one is the maximum allowable concentration of a pollutant. So you can uh, set this standard as this 
concentration. Or a combination of processes and uh, maximum allowable concentration. Nah. Okay, so what are the steps that we need to do to really develop the water quality criteria? So generally, we have to have several uh, things. For example, epidemiological data. Okay. So this epidemiological data usually is what we call as the historical data, right? Uh, it means that you have to have evidence that exposure to a particular uh, pollutant will cause harmful effect. Okay. And then the next thing is you need to have a toxicological data, which means you have to study the route of entry, whether it's uh, through uh, thermal, through ingestion, or through any uh, inhalation, any exposure, okay? how it enters into that particular body and uh, how it will cause harm to the body, which is the target organ. Okay? So maybe like mercury, it can target the central nervous system and so on. So the toxicological data and epidemiological data, they are together, very important, so that we can form something called a safety factor. Right? So this safety factor is used when we want to set the level of uh, the pollutant in the environment. So, but an example, when we want to develop a health criteria, okay, is that we have to have several uh, data, toxicological study, okay, uh, epidemiological study, like just now uh, I mentioned about the epidemiological study. And this uh, epidemiology, epidemiological study, they have uh, several disadvantages or challenges when you want to get this data. Okay? Uh, one include, uh, sometimes when you have chemical in the environment, it takes many, many years. There's a lag phase. Huh? It takes about maybe 10 years before it starts to show some effect. Okay? Uh, and then it also sometimes very difficult to identify which is the chemical. I'll give you an example. Let's say, uh, People introduce cigarette into the society. Okay? And so at the same time, people introduce a new antibiotics into the society. Right? So we have new uh, antibiotics and cigarette. Right? So these two different types of uh, chemicals, we don't know which one is the one that will cause problem. Right? So 10 years later, we start to observe problem. Right, we cannot identify it very easily because we need more data. Right, so, so sometimes we have more than one stressor or more than one chemical that can lead to a uh, problem that we have to determine. Okay, and uh, yeah, the third reason is it's very challenging to get the epidemiological study data because a lot of these uh, study they are based on observed study, okay, and they are usually done, if there's any study in the lab, it's usually done uh, using animals, right? So human, uh, there's no human that would want to be subjected to the uh, pollutant, okay? And then suffer from the effect long-term. So that, that's why we have uh, difficulty getting epidemiological data. And uh, other data that is required include safety factors and concentration factors, okay? that uh, this safety factor, concentration factor, they are data that generated from the first two, toxicological study and epidemiological study. So we look at the, if we look at the example, methyl mercury, this is uh, one of the form of mercury that can cause a lot of harm. And uh, we know the data that we need is in terms of uh, toxicological data. We need to know how this, uh, chemical be introduced into the uh, body. It can go through absorption through skin. It can go to the respiratory tract and so on. And uh, critical organ, central nervous system, distribution, excretion, and uh, biological elimination rate, all this you have to get before we can use it to set a health criteria. So, just to give you an example of how this is conducted, uh, after getting the data, you still need to get 
uh, data in terms of the exposure, right? Is there any exposure of human to that particular substance over uh, many years? And what are the effects? And what are the content in the environment? So all this study takes a very long time. So it, it, it can take up to 20, 30 years to conduct this study and to uh, set a uh, water quality standard. Okay. So after calculating all these results, okay, then finally you can set. Okay, let's say for this uh, case, mercury case, the total mercury intake after going through all this data should not exceed 0 0.8 milligram per day. And then after that, you can calculate, okay, calculate the concentration in water uh, and the concentration that will cause problem after taking into account safety factor of N is 0 0.0002 milligram per liter. So for these two slides, what I'm trying to highlight here is the difficulty of getting the data for health criteria, okay, for developing health criteria. So you can see here, you need to get the data from uh, different sources. And finally, after getting this uh, data, you can set the standard, the water quality standard. Okay. For example, uh, this one has been set by the European Commission as a one microgram per liter for mercury, WHO also one. And then uh, standard A and standard B, this one is a Malaysian standard. In Malaysia, we have our, our water standard, standard A and standard B. Standard A usually is for upstream, standard B is for downstream. So you can see here, standard A, five microgram per liter of mercury. Okay? Whereas standard B is higher, 50. The reason is simple because we have to make sure that the upstream is cleaner, right? Because if the upstream itself, um, it has less strict standard. Let's say if the upstream is 50, when it reach to the downstream, the water already very polluted, which is why for uh, industry that is at the uh, downstream, it's very difficult to keep up with the standard anymore. So that's why we have to set standard A and standard B at the different, uh, different standards. So just to show you some uh, standard, uh, yeah, this is A and B. You can see here uh, the standards, the difference in terms of the standards. Okay. The standard A is always stricter than the standard B. So this is uh, for Malaysia, just to show you the example of the standard that we set. Uh. Okay, so this one, uh, just to tell you that the standard has to be followed because sometimes you can pollute the environment if you do not follow. But then the problem is some people don't want to follow this kind of standard because it's too expensive to treat the water. Okay? But then if they discharge the water without getting a permit or if it is not within the standard, they will be fined. Okay, so now uh, the law state that we will find them and result in closure of the facility if they did not follow the standard. And if that particular wastewater that is discharged cause harm to human okay, or excessive problem, then we will start to consider jail, okay, jail term, and maybe uh, giving them heftier fine. Okay? So we have uh, a recent problem uh, in Malaysia. We have a uh, Water pollution. I don't know whether you have heard of this before or not. In uh, Selangor, uh, which is uh, one of the state in Malaysia, one of the wealthiest state in Malaysia, they have to shut down their water supply because of pollution. So some people they start to they, they like to dump chemicals into the environment uh, illegally because they want to avoid the cost of treating hazardous chemicals. Right. So it causes a uh, problem. Okay. It starts to give a, a, a very weird smell uh, in the river and the treated water. And they have to shut down the entire water treatment plant. So the, um, quite a large uh, area of Selangor uh, did not have access to clean water for some, some time. So the government is trying to find a way to, to uh, make sure that all these people they face their 
punishment. Okay? They're trying to make sure that we will not have this kind of problem again. So the parliament is trying to um, devise a law that will give us the power to punish all these people at the uh, heavier penalties. Okay? So more uh, standards. Okay, this is uh, in terms of the national river water standards. Okay? So in Malaysia, we have this interim uh, river water quality, uh, whereby we classify them based on class A, class 1, class 2, 2A, class 2B, and so on. So all these, uh, they have different quality. Okay? So you can look at this uh, slide for class uh, 1. Okay? Class 1, we have... Uh, Ammonical nitrogen 0 0.1, uh, class 2A, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, and so on. So different classes will have different uh, quality, water quality standards. And these classes, they are based on the intended use of the water. Okay. So class 1, you use it for uh, something. Let, let me see where I can get the... Okay, uh, give you an example. Ah, yeah, this one. Class 1, you use it for this one. Conservation of natural environment. Okay. Class two is for uh, water supply uh, for conventional treatment. Uh, there's some conventional treatment required of fishery. And then class five, irrigation. And then the last class, okay. uh, sorry, class five is uh, none of the above, which means it's the most, uh, it's the most polluted one, uh, the, it's the less stringent one. This is the class five. Okay. Class five, you can see here, uh, you, when you want to release the water for class five uh, river, you can exceed more than 2.7 ammonical nitrogen and so on. Because uh, class five, you don't use the water downstream. Okay. So all these are the classes of water. And you can see here, all these are based on the water quality index. Okay. So class one is the cleanest. Okay? If you want to release water to a class one river, you have to make sure that it achieves all this quality. And the water quality index has to be more than 92.7. And this water quality index is a measurement that we have to ensure that the water itself is at a certain standard. So this one, we will look at the calculation in a while. Okay? Just to show you that we have a different standard for quite a number of uh, pollutants, covering from aluminium up to uh, up to phosphorus, nitrate, nitrite, and so on. Okay, we have a huge uh, classes of pollutant things that we consider as pollutant. Of course, to have a new pollutant inside here, uh, a lot of things have to be done. I believe uh, in the coming years we will be adding uh, a lot more because of the uh, micropollutant. So we are suffering from micropollutant issue uh, today. Uh, quite a number of countries, uh, they have already detected a lot of micropollutants. And uh, that's why we have to come up with a, a policy to prevent people from dumping things that contain micropollutant. Okay? I believe uh, besides all this, uh, things like microplastics uh, and so on, they are the emerging pollutants they will be included in this uh, water quality standards in the coming future. Okay. This is a Malaysian uh, drinking water guideline. Uh. So for drinking water is uh, a bit different compared to the wastewater. Okay. So drinking water uh, is stricter. And uh, you can see here sulfate, the benchmark is 250 uh, milligram per liter and so on. So this one we have to be aware uh, that there's such thing that exists. Uh in every country in the world. Okay. So yeah, all these are the chemicals that can pollute the drinking water. And we have the guideline. And you can see all these guidelines, they are not random. Okay. Like just now what I mentioned is that they have these uh, steps uh, to, get, to, to get all these values. It's not like we just randomly select this value based on our observation. Okay. You have to go through a lot of steps. So WHO drinking water standards. Uh, this one is set by the WHO. Okay. This is uh, also almost the same okay. uh, compared to the Malaysian one. Okay. 
except that um, of course uh, they are also adding in new one, uh, new things every year because of the problem with emerging contaminant. Okay. So water quality index, like I said, is a measurement of the quality of that particular water. And uh, for this uh, water quality index to be measured, okay, so we have to know nine parameters. For example, uh, we have to know what is the dissolved oxygen, we have to know the pH and so on. So this uh, nine test is for the USA test, okay, the US test. And in Malaysia, we only go for six tests. Okay. We have the pH, BO, suspended solid, COD, BOD, and uh, ammonical nitrogen. But all these six tests, we compile them together, we get all these six tests, and then we use it to uh, quantify, to see which river is healthy, which river is not so healthy. So to do that, very simple, uh, there's a calculation, okay? Calculation to calculate uh, what is the water quality index of that particular river. And uh, yeah, this is how we calculate it. So this is a formula to calculate it, okay? And each of the parameters, it has a different weightage. So for DO, you have 0 0.22. For BOD, 0 0.19 and so on. Okay. So all we need to do in order to calculate what is the water quality index is to determine each of the uh, parameters. And then we fit into this equation. So let's say if you have a DO of a, let's say percentage saturation less than percent then the uh, calculation the uh, sub index is zero which means that in this uh, equation 0 0.22 times zero okay and so on so once we calculate all this value we will end up with a number okay this number can come uh, between zero to 100 so the 100 is the best one usually you can find it in the class one river okay and then class five river is the worst one. Okay. So less than 31, and uh, it, that's what we consider as the class five. Okay. That means you have to achieve water quality index of less than the one. Okay. So the advantages and disadvantages of using this technique is that if you want to measure the, uh, the parameters, okay, uh, and then use it to calculate. Sometimes the parameters that you have may not be sufficient. Okay, uh, let's see the disadvantages. Single bad parameter probably can change the whole water quality index. And uh, yeah, another one is that not many water quality parameters are considered for this particular uh, equation. Okay, we only consider pH, DO, BOD, COD, all those common ones. So other things like uh, maybe nitrate, nitrite, and so on, they are also pollutant and they are not considered into the equation. Okay? But the uh, advantage is, of course, uh, it gives us a means to compare between different water. You can compare this river and that river, and then we can get a value. Okay? That's an important thing. Okay, so I will uh, also stop here for like uh, five minutes to answer your question, if you have any question. Okay, I, I can see that. Um, okay. Could you repeat again uh, when we use standard A and standard B? Okay, okay. so standard A, and standard B, it depends on the uh, location okay, uh, of the particular area, uh, the factory. Okay. So standard A is intended upstream. Okay. Let me just draw the draw something again. Okay. So let's say you have a river, right? So this is your river, and the river flow is through this direction. I'm not sure why, why it becomes like that. Uh, let me just draw. Okay. So the river flow is through. Um, through this direction uh, from left hand to the right hand side. Okay, so if you have a factory here and a factory here, right, both factory they are releasing uh, wastewater into the river. Right, so this part 
This part here we, we consider as upstream. This the other part we consider it as downstream. Okay. So for upstream, usually we will use standard A. Okay. For downstream, we will use standard B. Okay. And the reason is uh, very simple, is because if the upstream we use standard B, then the water here will already be at uh, the polluted state. And then when you go to downstream, uh, up to this part, then uh, the factory here will not be able to discharge anymore. Because when if they discharge, they will even uh, pollute the river even more, right? So that, that's why you can see standard A is uh, 5 ppm. Let's say mercury, 5 ppm. Standard B, we have 50 ppm. Okay. So standard A will be stricter than standard B because of this reason. Because we want to prevent uh, the upstream people from discharging uh, a lot of this uh, pollutant and causing the river to be polluted. And when it reach down to standard, uh, to this uh, downstream, whereby they are using standard B, if it's the same, then they cannot discharge anymore because the, the water itself has already been polluted, right? So that's why they have to come up with two different standards, standard A and standard B, so that the upstream will not be able to discharge high amount to pollute the water to, ex to the extent where downstream will not be able to discharge anymore. So that's why we have these two different standards. Huh? Uh, one is to cater for upstream, one is to cater for downstream. So that's the difference between both. So oh, any, any other questions related to my uh, topic until now? Until, uh, until uh, topic five? Every, everyone is okay, yeah? Okay. Okay, so... Uh, after this, okay, the next one I want to talk about okay, is, uh, is on certain water quality parameters. Okay. So this part, I will, uh, I'll try to go a bit slower because just now I just want to give you some overview. Okay. Overview of what, uh, what this wastewater treatment is about, what are the water treatment, uh, okay, what are the uh, water treatment, rec uh, and then what are the regulation, and then uh, how we look at the standards, and why, why we need a standard is because we have to uh, make sure that when we discharge something, we don't pollute the environment. That's the sole purpose of the uh, water quality uh, regulation, okay? to make sure that we don't pollute the environment. Okay, so now we want to look at the water quality parameters. So what I want to say is that all the treatment method, uh, you can see innovation and so on, right? They are all designed to make sure that all these water parameter, uh, water quality parameters, they are met. Okay, uh, they are not exceeding a certain levels. Okay, and uh, yeah, they are designed to make sure that we we did not exceed the uh, required level by the government. Okay. Most of the water treatment uh, fund and innovation, they are, they are designed so that we can get the water, drink it, and make it safer so that we can consume it. Okay. So uh, first thing that I want to talk about is in terms of turbidity. Okay. So turbidity, in other words, is a measurement of whether, whether the water is clear or not. Okay. In the sense that, okay, let's say I have a water, right? If I have a lot of particles, right, then it will be very turbid. It will be very cloudy. Right? So what does it indicate? So it indicates that you have something in the water that could be harmful. So for example, uh, suspended materials. Right? So when you have a lot of suspended materials, obviously this uh, solution will be cloudy. It's an indication okay, uh, that you have suspended materials. Okay? This one. So, if you have microorganism, okay, I, I don't know whether you are aware of this or not, uh, but uh, when we want to culture a microorganism, for example, E. coli in the lab, 
that we have this uh, E. coli seed. Okay? This seed we add to a nutrient solution. So initially, the nutrient solution is very clear. Okay? You can see through it. It's very transparent. So when you add in uh, some of this E. coli seed, and then you put it inside the incubator, and you wait for like one or two days. Right? This is a nutrient solution. It will turn into a very cloudy solution or very turbid solution. Uh, that's, the, that's the signal that we have successfully cultured the microorganism. Okay? So this means that when you have something that is cloudy okay, uh, or something that is not transparent, you can suspect that it could have microorganism inside. And this microorganism could be harmful to us. Okay? So this is an in indicator. Turbidity is an indicator that uh, something unwanted is present. And uh, sometimes uh, this uh, consists of suspended material and they don't settle very easily. Okay? So it can be dissolved solids. It can be viruses, bacteria. It can be algae. It can be uh, anything, okay? colloidal solids and so on. So if it is a small particle, let's say it's nano size. Right? Of course, uh, when you look at the turbid solution, the first thing that we want to say is that we want to settle it. Of course, we, if we settle it, then we can drink. So if you look at nanoparticles, if you want to settle the nanoparticles, right, uh, it can take a very long time. Okay? It depends on the setting velocity. So when we design a sedimentation reactor, where we look at the setting velocity as one of the design criteria. So for nanoparticle, if you calculate the settling velocity, the time required to settle the nanoparticle, it can take up to 1,000 years. Okay. That's a lot of time, right? 1,000 years to settle down. And, uh, and where we don't have that amount of time to wait for this kind of thing to happen. Okay. So the ability itself, it has uh, several environmental significance in the sense that, uh, of course, obviously, it is aesthetically unpleasant. You look at it, it's not so, it's not so uh, pleasant to look at, right? So you want to drink it, of course, definitely a no, right? Uh, it also uh, will limit light penetration uh, in the sense that sometimes you have uh, hot plants that require sunlight. So if you have a very turbid environment, obviously the sun will not be able to penetrate into the, uh, into the lake or river. Okay? and give uh, the plant some energy to produce food through photosynthesis, right? So it can also cause burial uh, of an uh, organism, uh, clog the gills of fish, and so on. So sometimes uh, this uh, ability, it can cause a problem in filtration and also uh, disinfection, right? So how does it happen? Very simple. When you have these uh, particles, Okay. Let's say you have a very turbid environment where you have a particles, right? So these particles uh, sometimes can have microorganisms being attached to it. Right? You can see that the diagram here, you have a lot of uh, this round shape. Okay. When the microorganisms attach to these particles, they somehow prevent, prevent the uh, disinfectant from reaching to them. Okay. So we will look at the uh, innovation in uh, disinfectant disinfection technology uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, we will talk a little bit on the uh, chlorine disinfect uh, disinfection process. Okay. So usually uh, for disinfection, people use uh, chlorine. Right? And uh, this chlorine, uh, it, it needs to interact okay, in contact with the uh, microorganism so that disinfection can happen. Okay. So when you have uh, this particle protecting the microorganism, or pathogens, then what happens is that you will not have effective disinfection. That's why in the water treatment plant, uh, you can see that usually they want to remove all the solid first before the disinfection process uh, is conducted. Okay? So in disinfection uh, process is always the last step uh, for many reasons. So in terms of measurement of probability, okay, uh, yeah, we can measure it using uh, something called a turbidimeter. Okay. 
So the millimeter, you can uh, find it. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know whether, uh, yeah. I don't know whether at your university you have a turbidimeter or not, but you can find it uh, quite commonly in, in uh, water uh, quality lab. Okay. They use this turbidimeter uh, with formazine as the standard. Okay. So they have this formazine as standard, uh, okay. uh, whereby different concentration of formazine, it will give you different uh, light penetration. So the 4,000 ppm is uh, very cloudy, whereas uh, 10, 10 ppm is less, right? So, so in, in Singapore, uh, you can see that they are, they are re requiring one MPU okay, uh, of the quality, okay, water quality. They have to have one MPU or less uh, so that you can get this, drink this water. Okay? So they set it like this. Okay? So at this one MPU, this MPU is a measurement of the uh, WT. So one MPU is a... Uh, very clear, the water is very clear. Then uh, here you can see 4,000 is very cloudy. Okay. okay, in terms of sources of turbidity, uh, the sources of turbidity, you can, it can come from many areas, uh, including uh, erosion. So the river here, you can see it's very, very uh, brownish in color. It's because you have a lot of sediment floating in the river. All these, they are agricultural area. And with discharge, you can also cause this uh, turbidity problem when you discharge a lot of waste into the environment uh, consisting of suspended solids. Uh. Sometimes turbine runoff uh, also, you can carry a lot of uh, solids with it into the river. Okay. Eroding bank, uh, stream banks, when we carry out this deforestation, then uh, this, uh, this uh, erosion will take place. Okay, and then the stream banks will be eroded. Uh, and then we have the stirred up bottom sediments. Okay. And by all these sediments uh, at the bottom of, of the uh, river, it can be disturbed through uh, agitation. Or maybe when you have uh, someone swimming, okay, then uh, all these um, sediments will start to float. Okay. And then excessive algal growth will also contribute to it because uh, when you have algal growth, that means uh, you have a lot of uh, these nutrients and then nutrients growing this algae. So uh, this algae, when they grow, is like very, uh, like very muddy. Okay? And then they can, to some extent, contribute to the increase in turbidity of the water. Okay, so the next... Uh, The next thing that I want to talk about is in terms of order and taste. Okay? This order and taste uh, this, uh, is the most uh, widespread reason of complaint. Uh. Uh, in Malaysia, we have uh, complaints because of the smell of water. In uh, Singapore also, we have a lot of complaints uh, because of the smell and taste. So this is uh, not very uh, unusual. Okay? This is very common. And uh, usually this kind of uh, problem arise when we have uh, things like hydrogen sulfide. Okay? Sometimes we have uh, some organic compound containing sulfur. Okay? And then uh, you don't treat it properly. It goes to the wastewater treatment. And then you don't treat it, you release it. And then it goes to the water treatment plant again. Right? And then the water treatment plant doesn't really treat sulfur containing uh, organics. Sometimes it fails. And then you have degradation in the piping. It will release H2S. And this H2S will lead to a uh, problem. Okay? It will lead to smell, very strong smell, rotten eggs smell. Okay? So it's quite unbearable. So you can also have ammonia smell. Okay? Sometimes, uh, sometimes you can have uh, nitrogen-containing organics being degraded in the piping. We don't know that. But you, or the change in pH or any, any other uh, pollution in the water, you can have ammonia smell. Okay? And uh, taste is also something that uh, people tend to complain. Okay? okay, mineral and salt sometimes can give you some uh, taste, okay? salty taste, metallic taste, and so on. Um, and the reason why sometimes we 
tend to have this kind of uh, minerals and salt is because of the source of the water itself. So if we draw the water from groundwater, okay, so groundwater itself contains a lot of uh, minerals, right? Because uh, when you know, you, you know that the water, when it's in the underground, it flows through a lot of these uh, rocks, right? All these rocks, we call it as minerals. Uh, and these minerals, they have a lot of uh, ions, right? So these ions, when they are dissolved in the water, in the groundwater, we pump, pump the groundwater up and we don't remove all these uh, minerals. Then we will, uh, we will start to taste all this mineral in our water. Okay? For example, iron, okay, Fe. Iron is one of the most common uh, metals, okay, heavy metals uh, in groundwater. So we can see uh, iron uh, almost, uh, if not mistaken, almost everywhere. No? Uh, iron is, uh, yeah. So what we can do to remove iron from water, from groundwater is very simple. You just need to aerate it. Okay, you carry out aeration and uh, filtration process. And all those uh, iron, you can remove it easily. Okay. Okay. Uh, other things that contribute to taste is uh, microorganism and algae. Okay. When they are present, they can give you some unpleasant taste, which is uh, quite, uh, quite bad, uh, the taste. Okay. So I don't think uh, Malaysia and uh, Singapore have a uh, algae and microorganism problem in terms of the taste. But I'm not sure whether Indonesia uh, still have this uh, problem because last time I remember uh, someone told me that they have this problem in, in certain parts in Indonesia. Okay, okay in terms of the causes, uh, yeah, there are quite a number of causes of, of taste and on, on, uh, including uh, algae bloom, uh, Illegal dumping uh, and so on. Okay. Dissolved minerals, like I said just now, it, it can come from the uh, minerals, okay, like iron and manganese. Then you have accumulated debris, sludge, and uh, disinfection by products. Okay. And uh, one of the uh, complaints, uh, like I said this is, just now, we have uh, some complaints, right, in terms of the uh, taste and order in uh, in Penang, is uh, the chlorine. Okay, chlorine uh, is dosed into the water so that it can act as a disinfectant. So normally we would dose uh, chlorine at a higher concentration. Okay, once we treat the water, let's say, let's say we have the water, uh, water piping, right? And this is how the water flow. And then we have a house over here and a house over here. And then this one is the uh, water treatment plant. Okay. So usually when we want to uh, send out water, the water that uh, we send out will have slightly higher dose of chlorine. The reason is very simple. is because we want to have a post-disinfection uh, process whereby uh, we want to make sure that the water remains uh, clean okay, when we supply it to the consumer. Right? Because uh, sometimes uh, the water will be retained for a few days before it eventually reaches the consumer. So to make sure that the water is not contaminated with bacteria or anything, uh, what we do is we have to have a certain amount of chlorine. Right? So this house, the first house here, will receive the water first. Right? So when we draw the water, usually this part is higher concentration of chlorine. So the chlorine concentration will start to diminish. Uh, over time. And uh, when you reach the final house here, this house here will receive less chlorine in their water. Right. So usually the people who complain about the chlorine smell uh, is located over here, uh, the initial one where they receive the water first. Uh, right. They, they, they will tend to smell very strong chlorine smell. But uh, that doesn't mean that it's uh, dangerous. Right. Because uh, the chlorine dose that we add into the water. Uh, they are well controlled, which means that they are not exceeding a certain limit. So there's no danger of consuming chlorine uh, at that level. Okay? But of course, if the consumer is not so happy and they want to make sure that the chlorine smell is no longer there, they can easily boil the water. So this is one of the ways that they can do to remove the uh, chlorine smell. 
Okay, so the causes, okay, causes uh, like I mentioned just now, uh, you still have other causes like disinfection byproducts uh, and so on. And the significance of this uh, is that you will lead to poor appetite, not so serious. Okay? And nausea and vomiting and mental disorder. All these are basically psychology. Okay? So usually the water that's supplied to the consumer, they are not going to cause a lot of uh, problem. Okay? So I can see some, uh, some questions, right? Yes, Dr. Wenda, uh, but the question in Bahasa, I'm not sure if you can understand the <laughs> content. Okay. But I try to support you for... for I think it's okay. I, I should be able to understand. Oh, is it? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> okay. If you need uh, support for translation, I can help you. But if you can get the meaning, yeah, it, it's okay. really great. <laughs> let, me, let me go through this. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this question come from the student Arun Pratiwi. Uh, he's from University Sultan Agung Tirtayasa, located in in the really west part of Java Island. Uh, this okay. is uh, nowadays become a national university. So he she been learn uh, the special courses uh, we call it AMDA. Uh, it's regarding to the uh, how to say uh, analysis of the environmental impact. Yeah, regarding okay. to many activities. And she also been learn about uh, the topic about water and uh, uh, apa, reflecting to the Indonesian issue. Uh, as you know, Indonesia is the archipelago, huge archipelago, archipelago country, which is uh, we are really urged with the how to say supply for uh, clean water. Yeah, and in some certain part of our country, even it's very crucial uh, and also a huge problem to have or to get the clean water for daily purposes so uh, her question is uh, how uh, if you have any suggestion so uh, okay. do you have any suggestion for the society uh, to to how to say to treat water uh, individually in their home uh, for example uh, not only in their home but uh, as well in the environment for example they have uh, how to say riper yeah and so on uh, any kind of the surface water sources. So okay. how, how can uh, we, we share the technology or the technique yeah, for the society to be enabled to treat water individually or within the group in the society? Okay, I just so, have uh, the question. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, this is a very in interesting question. Uh. So um, I, I know that some, some uh, parts of the world, they, they have difficulty getting uh, water. Uh, and uh, of course, you, you first thing that I would recommend uh, if, if you have this kind of uh, situation, right, is to search for water source to see whether you have uh, you have uh, like groundwater or you have uh, surface water. Okay, that, that's the main thing. The first thing you have to know whether you have a water source or not. The second thing is that you have to see whether uh, what type of chemicals are present in the uh, water source. You cannot just simply take the water and then you have uh, you boil it and then you drink it. Because uh, in most cases, okay, it depends on the area. Some water may contain arsenic okay, and uh, a lot of uh, these minerals uh, uh, that can cause long-term harm. So we have to know what it did first before we really can design the waste, uh, water treatment plant for that particular population. So if you know that this particular water is clean, okay, then you want to uh, design a system uh, it, um, to send the water to uh, the people, uh, the consumer. Uh. So what I believe uh, this one you have to, okay, in terms of, uh, you have to approach the government, the local government to set up the, this um, water treatment plant. But if you want to do it yourself, right, uh, to see whether you can use this water to drink it, then that, that would be a bit problematic because I, I don't recommend uh, directly taking water from river without knowing the sources, uh, without knowing what is present in the water. Okay? But of course, the basic treatment unit that we can use to treat the water, uh, generally, if you have groundwater, in, this is just general, um, assuming that the water itself is not toxic and you can use it. Let's say groundwater, you have groundwater, you want to use this groundwater as a source of water, uh, you don't really need to do a lot of treatment because groundwater itself is very clean. Okay? 
groundwater, uh, you draw it out. That's why you can see a lot of wells, right? Wells around, whereby people take the water from the well and then they just use it directly. So that's recommended because groundwater is relatively clean. But that's just very general. Uh, but of course, sometimes groundwater may contain a lot of uh, minerals okay, or ions. Like for example, manganese, you have uh, iron. Okay? Iron is one of the very common uh, minerals in uh, groundwater. So what you need to do is you aerate it and then you filter it away. So that's the most basic and the cheapest way of treating uh, water. And when you are doing uh, aeration and, and uh, filtration, right, you are not only removing the iron, uh, you are actually also uh, removing certain uh, like suspended solids and uh, some, something else. Uh, uh, a lot of things are uh, in the water that is uh, not so good for drinking. Of course, uh, having said that, right, once you get that particular water, uh, you still need to boil it because you, you didn't really remove all those pathogens. Okay. So that's the most basic that I can recommend uh, if you want to uh, treat this kind of uh, water. So I think I can uh, maybe elaborate a bit more uh, later on. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Once I yeah once I get uh, more information on this. Okay. So. And to extend that question, uh, Doctor Wenda, sometimes just for your information, in a very remote area or even though in the certain area that uh, has really low uh, rain precipitation, yeah, sometimes they uh, how to say. Uh, collecting the rainwater for the store storage of the water to be used for daily purposes. Uh, so just they they provide uh, the oh, container, okay. yeah, to to store the rainwater and then finally they use. So do you have any suggestion? I, I guess it's not so good way, yeah, to directly use. So what what actually uh, how to say the uh, the, the if that's the case, uh, I, I would say that filtration technology is the best way to. Mm -hmm. Clean the water. Yeah, mm -hmm. you you once you collect the water from the rain. Uh, in fact, rainwater is a. Uh, by right, if there's no acid rain, right, rainwater is really clean, right. So what the the person need to do is just to filter it, uh, Filter, do some basic filtering. Uh, maybe with uh, some filter materials, and then uh, boil it. Then it's drinkable already, because the rain, like I said, rainwater doesn't contain a lot of pollutant. It's quite clean, unless of course you have uh, you have some uh, uh, maybe maybe uh, incinerator there, right? Incinerator sometimes it can generate a lot of dioxin and heavy metals. It can cause a lot of problem. So unless you have that kind of things there, then uh, rainwater is quite quite safe to drink. Uh. That's one thing. Uh. The second thing is that uh, of course uh, if really want to move on to another one step uh, further. Uh, uh, membrane technology is uh, is quite useful to get water. Okay, so uh, I I would say that uh, if cost is not an issue, membrane is the best solution. Okay. Uh, that's another one uh, thing that I would recommend. Uh. But we'll look into it further next week uh, in terms of how we can uh, have the membrane technology, how it can work. So, yeah. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, for, for, for many water purification uh, purposes, yeah? Obviously yes. Membrane. Yeah. Uh, membrane is a, it's a, it's a case, by, case by case also. Uh, it, it has to, you have to look at what type of uh, pollutant uh, that you have and so on. Then uh, if you are talking about... <laughs> if you are talking about rain, rain water, uh, <laughs> uh, membrane is quite durable. Uh. For, for this usage. But anyway, uh, yeah, this is the, the suggestion. Uh. So I, I will suggest more uh, uh, next week when we talk about membrane. Okay. And we also uh, will talk about filtration, right? Filtration uh, technology. Uh, I will also talk about filtration. Okay, I will cover a bit uh, how we can design this filtration system so that we can use it for low cost treatment of uh, water. So, okay. Okay, no. thank you, Dr. Wenda. For now, uh, I, I will continue with our yeah, with our, our course. Uh. Okay, this uh, this this one uh, yeah I, I covered uh, this one, the order and pace. 
Right, so I, I just now I talked about the chlorine concentration. So different parts of the uh, different parts of the uh, area we will get different chlorine concentration, which is why we will uh, we will see sometimes we tend to have a certain chlorine residue in our drinking water, and that's why we tend to have complaints. Okay. So these are the examples. Uh, okay. Um, these are the examples of uh, chemicals that can cause a lot of uh, taste and other problem. For example, geosmin. In geosmin, uh, this one is from the algae. So when I, last time when I remember when I was uh, in, in Korea, yeah, in Korea, they draw the water uh, from a river and they have this uh, problem okay, with geosmin. Uh, this, because uh, during the summer time, they have this algae. Uh, Algae growth, okay, excessive algae growth, and then uh, the geosmin is produced, okay, and then it goes to the water treatment plant uh, at that particular area, okay. I think it's uh, at uh, Daegu, okay, Daegu, Korea, and uh, what they do was they use ozonation to remove geosmin, okay. They ozonate the water first, and then after that, they uh, treat it. Uh, this is one of the solution. Uh. And then other things like uh, this MIB, uh, 2-methyl isoboronium, okay, it, it causes a uh, musty odor. And then chlorine, like I mentioned just now, it, it will give you a bleach smell, something that we don't want to have. Okay. Then uh, chloramine, also the same thing. This is the, these two, we use it as dis disinfectant. Okay. So other than that, you have con organic contamination. Uh, this ozonation process can produce aldehyde because ozonation you're oxidizing that particular uh, pollutant. So that's why sometimes we have this aldehyde. Okay. And the iron manganese are uh, usually in the groundwater and hydrogen sulfide, uh, yeah, we, when you have sulfate and sul uh, and uh, sulfate sulfur containing organics in the water. And then this will cause uh, some uh, micro microorganism reaction and you will have hydrogen sulfide been released. Okay. Okay. So anyway, uh, I will I will uh, try to try to get uh, some slides okay, to explain to you all on uh, how to design the low cost uh, low cost uh, water treatment plant uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, okay. So I know most of you seems to be very interested in doing that. Okay. So for now we will yeah we will talk about how we can determine odor and taste. So odor and taste, uh, if you want to determine, you use uh, this threshold odor test, okay? So this threshold odor test uh, is very simple. It's like you can see here, a lot of people are, are testing and uh, testing whether it smells or not, right? So this is a very subjective method. Uh. So once you start to smell that thing, then that's the uh, EON number, okay? uh, the threshold odor number. So very subjective, different people have different uh, sense of taste and smell. That's why we will see different results at the different places. Uh. Okay. So next uh, is uh, in terms of pH, uh, I just want to talk a bit on pH. Uh, pH is one of the master variable. And uh, pH is something that is very, very important because it will affect how a chemical behave in water. So if we have a low pH, then metal usually present in the ion form. If we have high pH, usually in the precipitate form. Okay. So it's very dependent on the type of uh, the pH is very dependent on um, the chemical is very dependent on the pH. Okay. So what affect the pH? You have the rocks, okay, minerals. They will affect the pH. And then uh, rain, acid rain, respiration, and uh, chemical dumping. All this will affect the pH. So this one is just to show you uh, different pH. You have different uh, different things. Uh, okay? For example, uh, milk is a pH 6.5 and so on. So you, if you have the ionized water, right, what do you think the pH will be? It will be acidic. So let's say you have the ionized or distilled water, okay, the pH will be acidic okay, when you expose it to the environment because of the carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide will form a carbonic uh, acid 
in the water. So um, pH will also play a very important role in terms of uh, uh, chemical behavior. And uh, yeah, microorganism itself can also play a crucial role in the formation of hardness. Okay? So all these, they are basically related. Okay? So pH, uh, in, like I said, in uh, water is usually acidic because carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid. And then uh, this carbonic acid can somehow react with calcium and magnesium okay? uh, to form calcium bicarbonate and magnesium bicarbonate and so on. So here, just to show you that pH actually plays a very, very crucial role in terms of the chemical reaction. Uh, yeah, these slides I just want to highlight to you. Iron, we have 4 ppm. Uh, not toxic if it's at pH 4.8. If 0 0.9 is at pH 5.5, it's very toxic. So same thing for ammonia. Ammonia also, if it's neutral or acidic, okay, uh, it is harmless. But if basic, it is toxic. Reason, very simple, because of this equilibrium, right? NH4 plus is readily converted to NH3 when you have basic pH. So when this uh, conversion happens, NH3 will go into the uh, gut lumen. Uh, in other words, it will cause uh, toxic, toxic effect of ammonia in the uh, organism. So this one, uh, just to show you more on the effect of pH on the uh, different organism. Okay? So you look at the eggs, right? If you have a different, uh, different pH, some of the egg will not hatch. Okay? Like for example, pH 5, most of the uh, fish eggs, they will not hatch. So this is very uh, crucial. So in terms of determining pH, uh, yeah, you can use pH meter and so on. This one, I, I believe most of you already know how to use a pH meter since uh, most of you are chemists, right? And uh, dealing with water, okay? So I will, I will go through this uh, quickly. Okay. So solids, uh, on the other hand, uh, another one thing that is very important in water, okay? solid, you can be organic or inorganic. It can be dissolved or it can be suspended, okay? You have total dissolved solid, you have total suspended solid. The difference is uh, dissolved solids, they are related to hardness, salinity, or conductivity. So hard, hardness uh, in water means that it is uh, concerning the calcium and magnesium ion. If you have a lot of ion in the water, that means uh, if you have a lot of ions like calcium and magnesium in water, that means it's hard. We call that water as hard water. Okay? Uh, and uh, Usually when you have a uh, water that is quite hard, okay, uh, which means you have a lot of calcium and magnesium, it is uh, like very problematic uh, because sometimes you have scaling problem. Okay? And I know groundwater, you can also have a lot of calcium and magnesium. Okay? So last time when I uh, was visiting somewhere, right, uh, uh, I was told that, okay, I, 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 I believe it is in, uh, I think it's in Germany, I think. Yeah. I, I was told that the water that they draw there is from a groundwater. And the groundwater contains uh, calcium and uh, magnesium. So that's why when they when I want to take a shower, right, they, they ask me to wipe the floor, make sure that the water on the floor uh, is uh, not there after I shower. Reason is very simple because when you have calcium and magnesium and then when you shower and you leave the water there, once it dry, and it becomes a white precipitate. Okay, it will the calcium will react with uh, carbon dioxide to form calcium carbonate. So it, it will be like a white color uh, precipitate with a very uh, very uh, difficult to remove uh. So it's very difficult to remove once it forms. So that's why uh, this is one of the problem uh, Yeah, uh, when you are using hot water. Okay. So of course, uh, as long as it doesn't uh, exceed a certain threshold, uh, the hot water is still drinkable. Uh, okay? So there's a, so I think it's one gram per liter. As long as it doesn't exceed that, it's still okay. Okay, okay so for solids, uh, the other one is a suspended solid, which is related to turbidity. Okay? So we have the total solid as the combination of both. Uh, okay? And uh, if you want to determine it, very simple. Just uh, using gravimetric procedure, and gravimetric procedure uh, easily, I mean, easily done in any lab. 
we just need to uh, carry out filtration and evaporation process. So for this case, uh, yeah, sample here, okay, you filter it, evaporate the filter, you get the suspended solid. On the other hand, if you want to get the total dissolved solid, you just need to evaporate the filtrate. Okay? Now this is uh, very easy to determine. So the solids are significant because, uh, let's say if you have total dissolved solids, right? In drinking water, yeah, like this now what I said, total dissolved solid cannot exceed one gram per liter. Okay? Uh, because provided that the dissolved solid is not something that is harmful. Uh, okay? uh, then the dissolved solid may affect certain industrial processes, for example, semiconductor industry. It needs very pure deionized water. Okay? And sometimes it can cause corrosion okay, if you have very high uh, dissolved solids. Okay? So in, in uh, pollution control, usually we design a wastewater treatment plant uh, based on the total suspended solid. Let's say it's a sedimentation reactor. You want to design it, you have to look at the suspended solid. Uh, uh, and the setting velocity and so on. So there's a certain design criteria that you have to fulfill uh, to design the size and the, uh, the depth of the tank. Okay. So after that, uh, is, uh, the next one is dissolved oxygen, which is also quite important. So dissolved oxygen, uh, yeah, this one, it, this dissolved oxygen DO is important because uh, every living organism uh, needs oxygen to survive. So like fish, okay, fish, you need oxygen in water. You need to have a certain EO level so that you can have metabolism. Otherwise, if you no, don't have any oxygen in the water, fish may suffocate, okay? So this is how the typical uh, process is, okay? You have uh, oxygen consumer, fish, microorganism in water. They will consume the oxygen and then they will go to the uh, oxygen producer, which is the green plant. Sometimes algae can also be considered as oxygen producer. And uh, sometimes there are external oxygen supply. Okay? This oxygen su supply can come from uh, interfacial aeration or natural aeration. So this is uh, how it looks like. Okay? okay, there are several things that I just want to uh, highlight is that oxygen itself, uh, in terms of the chemical characteristics, is uh, not very soluble in water. And it depends on the uh, various factors, higher temperature, lower uh, saturation concentration. This is uh, important. Okay. So as you increase the temperature, the oxygen in the water will decrease. Okay. And if you have a lot of salt in the water, the saturation concentration will also decrease. Okay. So when you want to design a biological system, okay, uh, you have to consider supplying the dissolved oxygen and you have to make sure the dissolved oxygen is sufficient so that you can uh, you can design an effective biological treatment system. So bioremediation uh, is very dependent on oxygen content that you have, especially the aerobic, uh, aerobic uh, biodegradation system. Okay? So this is uh, one of the key points that people use to design all this uh, bioremediation technology. So what is good in terms of DO is uh, eight to nine is the best one, but very difficult to achieve because we sometimes have a lot of ions in the water. Uh, then the next one is uh, 6.7 to eight. This is slightly polluted. And the most polluted one is this one below four. Okay? So if a lake, Okay, a uh, lake containing less than 4 ppm usually is the, what we call the eutrophic lake. So eutrophic lake, in general, they are uh, H, H lake, uh, which means that it's very old, right? very old, and uh, it will tend to have a lot of these uh, greenish uh, things, which is what we call the algae. Uh, it will grow excessively. Okay. So to determine very simple, we use a uh, deal prop. Okay. So like I said just now, uh, Bio important for survival and aerobic uh, biological wastewater treatment processes, DO is very, very critical. Okay. And to have DO in water, very simple, natural processes or artificial re-aeration. Okay. okay, so for designing a biological wastewater treatment plant, important thing is 
BOD and COD. Because these two, BOD and COD, are the ones that will determine whether you can use biological uh, treatment method or not. Okay? So BOD means that the amount of oxygen used by bacteria to decompose your organic materials okay, in the water. So you measure the concentration of decomposable organic matter, and then that's the BOD. Okay? It is useful so that you can use it to indicate the pollution strength. Okay? Okay, um, yeah. So the determination of BOD is very simple. You use a uh, jar test. Okay? This one I will not elaborate further. Uh, it's a very simple test, uh, but the drawback is that you need five days to do this kind of test. Okay? The other one is a COD. COD is uh, when you measure everything that is oxidizable in the water. And uh, usually this is good because uh, this is a more preferred technique of measuring uh, the strength because of the uh, time taken. You only need three hours okay, so that you can get the COD. And why I say that it's uh, very important to design and determine whether the biological system is useful because uh, you can determine whether your particular wastewater is biodegradable or not through the BOD to COD ratio. So if your BOD to COD ratio is more than 0 0.5, you know that more, most of this component in your wastewater contains a lot of biodegradable materials okay, or biodegradable chemicals. So you can use biological treatment. But if you have low BOD, let's say it's less than 0 0.3, right? BOD to COD ratio less than 0 0.3, you, you need to find other treatment methods. Most of the time, the more preferred uh, one is the chemical treatment. Okay? If biological treatment cannot be used, then the next best thing would be chemical treatment. So some people use wet air oxidation okay, to remove the pollutant. Some people also use certain techniques to increase the biodegradability of the uh, wastewater. So it depends on the nature of that particular uh, wastewater. Okay. So uh, another one thing that I want to highlight is uh, this one is related to disinfectant and disinfection technology. So usually when we want to look at uh, whether the water is polluted with a microorganism or not, we can do this total coliform or fecal coliform test. So this is an important biological uh, test to look at pollution, microbial pollution. Okay. So yeah, what we measure is the total coliform, this one, the whole thing. Once we know that something is present, it can be E. coli, it can be something that is less uh, harmful. Well, we know something is present. Okay? So two tests can be used to determine. One is the present absent. The other one is the using uh, membrane uh, to test the concentration, okay? uh, membrane filtration and multiple tube fermentation. Okay? So present absence is very simple. You need to add chemical into water. And after some time, if the water glows, you know microorganism is present. Okay. This is just a qualitative test uh, to tell you whether it, it is present or not. The other one is the membrane filtration. So you pass the water through a filter and then you put in a growth medium and you incubate. Okay. And then after some time, you count, you count the colonies. So if you have a lot of colonies, then you know that the water is briefly polluted. Okay, okay so I've covered all the... I guess we have two questions for, from the participants. Maybe before you move to the final topic. Ah, okay, sure. Yeah, you can try to reply. Uh, the question from Pandu Pamungkas and Lutfi. Can you see the question? Okay, yeah. Okay, okay. So English already. Question, yeah. Why the color of river water is more cloudy than sea water? Whether the color of the water is aggregated or Okay, then the second one is uh, we have a problem with sludge on the paper machine. We may have a reaction. Okay, so uh, the, for the first question, uh, why is it uh, cloudy? Uh, well, um, it depends on the on the river itself, you know. Uh, some, some river is clear, some river is cloudy. It's because of the turbulence of the of the uh, river water. You have turbulence uh, and then you will stir up all the sediments. So when you have a sediment being stirred up, right, 
then uh, that's why you can see that it's very cloudy in color. So most of it is just the uh, suspended solids, the sand, the small sand, and so on. Uh, because it, some river, it moves very fast. That's why this is the problem. Uh, seawater, I would say the seawater, you also have this kind of uh, problem. It's also cloudy, you know? It's not so clear also. Uh, yeah. So, yes, you are right. Color of the water is an indicator of water greenness. Uh, to some extent, you can see that. It's an, if you look at it, if it's not cloudy, definitely something is there. So, it is not clean. Right, like just now the example that I give, a microorganism. When you have microorganism growing in the in the water, it will become cloudy. Right, you have a lot of microorganisms, then it's a lot more cloudier. So it's an indicator. So in terms of what technology can purify water, uh, this one it depends on case by case basis, uh, because not all technology can be used for all cases. So if you talk about uh, river water. You want to remove all the sands. That's very simple to do. Uh, you just need to have certain uh, filtration uh, technique installed, uh, filtration system installed in the in the uh, water water area. Okay. When you draw the water, you filter off all the solids. Then you already solve that problem. But if you talk about purifying water uh, to remove all the organic contaminants in the water, that will be something else, uh, uh, a more challenging issue. Uh. It depends on what type of uh, pollutant that you have in the water. If you have micropollutant, that means they are present in very small concentration. Then you have to use uh, certain technologies such as advanced oxidation technology to remove them. You can also use RO membrane to remove all those uh, impurities. So it depends on the concentration, it depends on the case, it depends on a lot of factors. Uh. So the other one is on the uh, question is on the problem with starch from paper machine. So, um, so for this question, I cannot really uh, recommend anything except that uh, if, if you want to reduce the sludge, uh, I, I need to know what is the sludge, what's the characteristics of sludge, and so on, before we can actually decide on uh, a recommendation. Maybe you can drop me an email uh, with further details so that I can uh, give you a better answer. Okay? I think that would be better because uh, now uh, from the information here, uh, I think it could be difficult for me to say something that might that what I say might not be true. I, I don't want to have this kind of uh, impression. Uh, okay. So you, you can, uh, if you have any further recommendation, you can always drop me an email uh, or maybe I can create uh, maybe a page whereby you can just put your answer, question there then I will answer it. That, that will be like better. Everyone can see the answer. Okay, so um, I think I have about 10 minutes left. So yes, uh, I will quickly go through the most important part of the whole lecture today is we want to know why we want to innovate new technology. Okay. So reason is very simple. Why we still need to have all this new technology uh, in our world. First thing is that we want to make sure that we operate at a lower capital and uh, maintenance cost. Okay. Everything is about cost. If you go to somewhere, you want to, you want to do something, we talk about the economic, uh, economic reason. It's about money. Okay? Money will enable everything. So for this case, the same thing. Why we want to have new innovation? Because we want to lower our cost, make the water treatment unit smaller, more efficient, and uh, easier to operate. Okay? And then, of course, we also want to look into better effluent water, uh, water quality. Because uh, nowadays we have a lot of new pollutants coming into the environment. Because we are progressing, okay? And uh, because of our progress, we develop new chemicals and we cause new problems. That's why we have to innovate. And finally, lower waste production. Okay, uh, when you have, uh, like, let's say you have RO membrane uh, doing desalination, okay? So if you are doing desalination, that means you're drawing seawater and you are removing all those. Uh, all those uh, water and you can remove from the seawater. So usually for RO membrane to operate, you cannot remove 100% of the water. Okay? Uh, maybe you can manage to remove 40%, okay? uh, separate 40% of water from the seawater and the remaining 60%, you have to throw it somewhere else. Right? So if you can achieve higher efficiency, which means you can draw 60% of water from the uh, seawater, 
the 40% of the seawater, which is uh, considered waste. Okay? That one is what we call the brine. Uh, that, that one you have to discard it. So you can actually lower the waste production if you have a better technology. So just to show you some uh, wastewater treatment uh, trend, uh, this is what we observe uh, uh, over the time. So when about 100 years ago, the first generation of uh, wastewater treatment, we talked about achieving the regulation. We want to meet the regulation of uh, the policy maker. Okay? The government sets a certain regulation and we just want to clear it, no problem. Okay? Uh, then after that, the second generation, people start to notice that a lot more pollution needs to be addressed quickly. So that's why we have to come up with certain, uh, certain uh, improvement to make sure that the technology can meet the tighter regulations set by the government. And another one thing is to reduce energy consumption, okay? to make sure that we are uh, more sustainable. Okay? So for this case, we designed the uh, treatment system to have uh, additional, if you look at this two, right? Uh, this one, uh, very basic. The second one, we have advanced binary digester. Okay? So this one is the, something that we install into the wastewater treatment to make sure that we can have better biogas production, better sludge treatment, and so on. And then now we are looking into the third generation. Uh, third generation is, uh, what we want to see is water recovery. And we want to get uh, energy neutral energy generation from the water treatment plant. So it, it's, it doesn't make sense if we, if we treat water and uh, in the end, we end up spending more energy and what we treat is not usable, right? So the generation look into what, whether we can recover the water again, right? And then use it again for various purposes. And then to look into whether we can uh, get energy out of the wastewater. Let's say you have carbon, you can get energy from the carbon so that you can power up your uh, treatment plant. So you, you can see that a lot of uh, this uh, third generation uh, wastewater treatment plant is being built, especially in Europe. We are emphasizing a lot on this. Uh, okay? And then finally is resource recovery. A lot of uh, very active research is looking into resource recovery. So the phosphorus and nitrogen that you have in wastewater, uh, you can recover it. Okay? And then uh, how to recover it? Simple, through strophic formation. Okay? So this one, uh, once you, you recover it, you can use it for a lot of application like fertilizer and so on. So this is, uh, this is an emerging, uh, emerging area. Okay? This is just uh, something Okay, this is just uh, an elaboration of the slides just now. Okay. okay, so one of the main reasons okay, that we want to improve our technology is the emergence of many different new pollutants. Okay. So for example, pesticides. Okay, pesticides, uh, this is not new, okay? this is not new, but then this is something that uh, we recently discovered uh, is the pesticide sometimes can uh, react with certain uh, component in the water to produce something that is toxic. Let me give you an example in Sri Lanka. Okay. In Sri Lanka, uh, I'm aware that they have this glyphosate problem. Glyphosate is a chemical that they use uh, for their, uh, as their pesticides okay, for their agricultural area. So this glyphosate is very easily treated. So what they are not aware when they apply is that this glyphosate can also bind with heavy metals. Okay. When this glyphosate bind with heavy metal, it, uh, its behavior changes. So which means that um, it will slip through the water treatment plant and it will end up in consumer, uh, consumer side. Okay. So when this happens, then uh, of course, uh, it's not so desirable because when you ingest something containing heavy metal and uh, pesticides, you will suffer from the field effect. Okay. Yeah. So another one case is, uh, like I mentioned, it's not a DDT case from the pesticides. So this DDT generally can lead to uh, various health issues uh, that has, has already been proven previously. So microbial pollution, uh, the next one is also emerging. Uh, this one, uh, you can see it in many rural areas, 
and areas where they don't have access to clean water. Now, even in emergency areas, uh, like for example, if you have a quick earthquake happening, right? And then suddenly they don't have any uh, water supply anymore. And then most of the people will tend to draw, take water from uh, random places uh, because water is uh, like not so easy to get when you have emergency. So uh, for example, if you have you look at uh, countries like in Bosnia, in, uh, in, in Africa, sometimes they have earthquake, right? And then they don't have the correct facilities. So they have to draw water everywhere. And uh, they have this risk of microbial pollution. Uh, okay? So of course, uh, microbial pollution, uh, there are a lot of technologies uh, uh, that can be solved, but not all technologies, they are cost effective. Okay? Most of the technology that uh, we want, they are either not mobile or they are expensive. So that's why uh, people are looking into trying to get uh, something, okay? a technology can be deployed, that can be deployed into these areas uh, quickly uh, without any uh, additional cost or it's not so expensive. So I don't know whether you have seen uh, this, uh, sometimes uh, people use this uh, straw where they design a straw with a lot of uh, filters in the straw so that they can just drink it directly from the water. So maybe I'll show it to you uh, in the future slides. So another one uh, of the important, important pollutant is the microplastics. Uh, probably you have heard of microplastics. There are tiny plastics in the environment. Okay? And uh, these microplastics has been detected in drinking water. Okay? In the uh, UK, uh, just recently I saw a report. In UK, there are people uh, detecting this microplastic in their water. So this is a... Uh, this is something that we have to be concerned. Although there's no, no proven effect of microplastics yet, but then uh, we have to start to uh, be aware because for human, of course, some, it may not be a problem for human, but uh, it has already been shown that it can cause a lot of uh, different physical or chemical harm to small animals. So another one is a micro pollutant. This is one of the emerging uh, pollution that we have. Uh, this this micro pollutant, uh, it, they are chemicals. Okay, they are present in very small amount, uh, and are capable of causing a lot of harmful effect to human. For example, pharmaceuticals and so on. So this one we will discuss a bit further uh, in the future future uh, lecture. Okay, then we have heavy metals. Uh, this one. Heavy metals uh, like arsenic, they are present in the environment. So new innovation is needed to remove all these heavy metals uh, because uh, the existing technology is very difficult to be deployed. Uh, and especially arsenic, arsenic you want to treat it, not so easy to treat because uh, they can exist in many forms. Okay? Heavy metal can interact with a lot of uh, organic compound or humic acid. Okay? Uh, to form something that is completely different in terms of its characteristic. So that's why we have to keep innovating something that can remove all this. And uh, another one is nanoparticle. Okay, nanoparticle like uh, TRO2. Uh, TRO2 is something that a lot of people are exploring uh, as a photocatalyst. But what they are not aware is that uh, this photocatalyst, sometimes uh, if it leach into the environment, it's not so good also. It's also harmful. Right. So uh, this is what we have to look at okay, in the coming uh, weeks to see what, what are the possible technologies that we can use. Okay, what are the innovations that we can apply to remove all these things. Okay, so this is uh, the end of uh, our lecture today. Okay, so um, I have this, uh, this uh, link over here. This is a link for you to, to do your quiz. Okay. So I hope that most of, most of you uh, here, okay, if you have uh, time, we can go to this link and uh, try to solve the questions. It's very simple question related to this week's lecture. So uh, I will copy the link uh, to the chat okay? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, that, so that you can access. Huh? Okay. Is that okay? okay, that's all for my mm -hmm. uh, lecture today. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wenda. Uh, so is there any how to say time limit for doing quiz? Must be submitted. Uh, no, uh, the, the no, time I, limit. No. So this is just uh, for for the students. Uh, no, this is just like a quiz uh, for today. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Lecture. So 
Yeah. yeah so there's there's no assessment. There's no nothing. So okay. it, it's just uh, for them to like uh, try out the question. Okay. okay. So uh, I, I'm okay. I'm still okay to accept any questions uh, if uh, you all have mm -hmm. uh, questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So to all participants, if you still have any questions, yeah, or suggestion or comment due to the content that just delivered by Dr. Wenda, please kindly unmute your microphone or even you can still write down the question in the chat room. So just for your information, uh, we also provide the attendance list. Yeah, uh, for our uh, administration uh, record. Yeah, so please kindly uh, fill the poll. Yeah, also Dr. Wenda already kindly uh, provide the link for the quiz. And how about the lecture content, Dr. Wenda? Yes. Oh, okay. I will upload it uh, online. Yeah. I will oh, okay. provide the, the content uh, later. Is it okay? okay. Uh, I will upload sure. it first and then, yeah. Sure. Maybe in a sure. Google uh, Drive. Uh. I'll share okay. the link yeah. later. Sure, sure. It would be very helpful, yeah, for the participants to, uh, how to say, uh, uh, review again, yeah, your lecture after. <laughs> uh, okay, so still any question or comment, please, before we close this lecture session? And... Okay, may I, I have a question? May oh, I sure. ask yeah. Mr. Hoffman there? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Pedro from Padang, uh, Mr. Okweda. Uh, it's very interesting to uh, follow your lecture today. Uh, but uh, I want you to describe me. Uh, in Indonesia, we know Amdal. Uh, we call Amdal as to to control uh, uh, environmental environment uh, quality like water, uh, gas, or air and land. But uh, the quality of our environment is still uh, questionable. Uh, would you please <laughs> to tell me and describe how to control the quality, uh, your environment uh, quality in your country, uh, uh, punishment uh, or reward for? OK, so uh, let me just uh, repeat again another question. Um, you are asking how to control the uh, quality of uh, the environment, right? So, um, okay, generally, this is a very subjective question uh, because uh, it, it's very difficult. I, I can understand that it's very difficult to, uh, to control it. Uh, even if you say that, okay, this one cannot be done, then some people are still doing it. We, we don't know why they are still doing it. But I, I would say that the, the most effective strategy uh, is education, right? Um, education, uh, we have to raise awareness uh, to tell them that why they cannot do this and over time, okay, this is a long-term strategy. Lah. Education, uh, to let them know that this is wrong and we have to do a proper, uh, proper, proper disposal so that we can uh, have a better environment. So, yeah, in terms of uh, reducing this uh, uh, problem, uh, the best is education. But because uh, even if we like uh, design the best waste disposal, waste water treatment plant and so on, if the people are still dumping those things into the environment, uh, then we are also still facing the same problem. So that, that's my, my take on this. Uh. And uh, in, in Penang, uh, we, we try to solve it through uh, campaign. Uh. We, we have this uh, government whereby, uh, okay, first thing we have issue with, last time we have issue with plastic waste, right? So we try to uh, reduce the usage of plastics. We tell the people that uh, plastics is very, very harmful to the environment uh, and so on, so that they are aware that if they take these plastics and they throw it away, then eventually it will cause harm to the environment. So this is a long-term strategy that uh, our government is trying to do. And then uh, besides education, uh, uh, in Penang, uh, we, we have waste water treatment plant and water treatment plant. Uh, but then I would say that all this uh, is still not as effective as uh, having good education and campaign. 
Okay, so this is uh, the answer that I will give uh. Okay, uh, yeah, you 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 cannot you cannot just install everything and then uh, get the best uh, technology, but then people still throwing it uh, on the ground. People just throw it just like that, uh, right? And then people discard all those uh, antibiotics into the water and so on. So this will definitely harm the environment. Uh. So I, I hope I answer uh, your question. So best way is always through uh, policies and education. Uh. Okay, thank you, Dr. Render. Is there any questions again from the participants? Oh, I think... Uh, it's enough for today, Dr. Renda. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Fitri has another uh, agenda. So, okay, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, this, uh, I think thank you so yeah. much. So thank you so uh, much for your, for your attendance and uh, for all of the participants. Thank you so much. Don't forget to fill the link that Dr. Renda provide in the chat room and uh, the attendance form for those who want to earn the credits from this uh, lecture series. And uh, see you tomorrow on the same time. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Wenda. Thank you. Thank you all. See you next week. <laughs>